Colleagues, could you please take your seats? Now, first of all, I should open the committee meeting. Now, we haven't had any requests for amendments to the agenda, so I suppose we can adopt it. That brings me to the second agenda item. There are um, uh, all languages provided today other than Estonian and Maltese. And I'm particularly sorry we don't have Maltese today, but we do also have Croatian. Now, we also have uh, uh, feedback from a uh, number of delegation visits, CB CDB, CBD and uh, others. We've got the 18th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, DOA. Now, the Environment Committee sent a delegation, as usual, and you will receive those reports uh, in written form on the uh, committee website, so we'll be able to look at those reports. Now, next Thursday, between 9 o'clock and uh, 10.30 in the morning, we have an extraordinary meeting together with the Health Commissioner, Mr. Borg, and this will be on the topic of horse meat and the, the food chain in general. So that's an extra meeting next Thursday from 9 o'clock till 10.30. That also brings me to the third agenda item for today, which is our most important item, and that is the public hearing on tobacco products. Now, I'm very pleased to see that we've got a lot of good speakers here, but not only the keynote speakers, we also have the Irish Presidency, the Irish uh, Health Minister, uh, Mr. Riley, and we also have our Health Commissioner, Tony Borg, who has been following this dossier for quite a long time. This is a very important item for him. It's one of the most important items for us, too. So we're, uh, we realize that even... Uh, in the early stages, we've had a lot of interest in this dossier. The Parliament wants to work through uh, uh, this as quickly as possible. We need to get the proposal on the table as soon as possible so that we can uh, complete it as soon as possible. Now, uh, Shadow Rapporteur Linda McGavin, Linda McGavin is uh, uh, going to be uh, working hard on getting this through, uh, through the, um, the committee. Sorry, rather, the main rapporteur, Linda McAvan, and the shadow rapporteurs will be piloting us. So we'll uh, get straight down to work. We'll give the floor straight to Mr. Riley, the Irish Minister for Health. But first of all, I'd like to remind you to keep to the schedule so that all of the members who work in the committee can ask questions. We also need to have uh, decent answers to those questions. So, Minister, you have ten minutes precisely to introduce us to the topic. So, Minister, go ahead. It's your turn. Cahir, look, match is good. Done a career, kind in you, in the show. I'd like to thank the Chair, Matthew Scrooge, for the invitation to speak at this hearing and for the opportunity to speak about our efforts in Ireland and Europe to deal with tobacco and the damage caused by smoking. It's important to take a moment to consider the immense damage that smoking causes and the economic burden it places on Europe. Approximately 700,000 Europeans die every single year of tobacco-related causes. Smoking is the largest avoidable health risk in Europe, causing more problems than alcohol, drug abuse and obesity. EU public health care expenditure on treating smoking attributable diseases is estimated at 25.3 billion euro annually. And 8.3 billion euro is lost annually in productivity from deaths, absenteeism and early retirement linked to smoking. 
And that's before you count the cost of the human misery that this habit causes right across all our people. We're all aware that half of all long-term smokers will die from smoking-related illnesses. And what does this equate to statistically? The World Health Organization has reported that tobacco caused 100 million deaths in the 20th century. If the current trends continue, it will cause up to 1 billion deaths in the 21st century. We cannot allow this to continue. A Eurobarometer survey shows that 28% of the EU population smoke. The overall prevalence rates for Ireland are more or less similar to the EU average, with 29% of Irish adults being current smokers. This is simply not acceptable. Nicotine is an immensely addictive substance, and once our children and young people become addicted, they are trapped by this addiction, with recent studies showing that 70% of smokers in Europe began smoking before the age of 18. We must act now to make something less attractive or smoking less attractive to our young people. Indeed, in a survey in Ireland, there was 78% of smokers surveyed said they'd started smoking before the age of 18, when they were minors. So what are we doing to alleviate the societal and economic burden placed on us by smoking? What can we do to discourage people from smoking? I have been very public since my appointment as Minister for Health in Ireland about my commitment to tackle the problem of smoking. Indeed, I have indicated that the Tobacco Products Directive is my key priority during the Irish Presidency. No one measure alone can reduce the number of smokers or the number of our children who start to smoke. A combination of measures is required. This includes effective legislation, comprehensive support for smokers who are trying to quit, and sustained media and education campaigns on the harmful effects of smoking. All these measures have the effect of denormalising tobacco use in our society, which in my view, is the most successful way to prevent future generations from continuing the habit. The proposed revision of the Tobacco Directive is a key tool in preventing our young people from starting to smoke. As Commissioner Borg has stated previously, the ambition of the proposal is to make tobacco products and smoking less attractive and thus discourage initiation among young people. The proposal aims to achieve this by placing stricter rules on features that increase the attractiveness of tobacco products, for example, ban on characterising flavours and flavourings. It also proposes to increase the size of the health warnings on the tobacco product packs. As you are aware, the proposal will address labelling and packaging, ingredients, regulation of nicotine containing products, illicit trade tracking and tracing system and security features. My objective during the Irish Presidency is to build consensus and to facilitate agreement among Member States on the proposal so that negotiations can commence with Parliament as soon as possible. As stated earlier, I am personally committed to tackling the problem of smoking and I'd like to take a moment to discuss Ireland's achievements to date in moving towards a tobacco-free society. Indeed, I feel the word achievement should be substituted for the word progress. A comprehensive range of tobacco control legislation is in place in Ireland, which places us in the top rank of countries internationally. Some of these significant initiatives include the successful implementation of the Smoke Free Initiative in 2004, the ban on the sale of packets of cigarettes of less than 20 in 2007, groundbreaking legislation in 2009 that introduced the ban on in-store display and advertising, and the introduction of a retail register. A prohibition on self-service vending machines except in licensed premises or in registered clubs. A ban on sale of tobacco products to individuals under the age of 18 years. Cigarette price increases aimed at reducing smoking prevalence and preventing children and adolescents from taking up the habit. The introduction of graphic warnings on cigarette packs as and from the beginning of this month. Specifically, I believe that the ban on the sale of packs of cigarettes of less than 20, removing the point of sale display and advertising, and the introduction of graphic warnings will have a significant positive impact on our young people in the longer term. Indeed, it is heartening to see that in a recent survey, the number of Irish children who smoke and who were aged between 10 and 17 years of age 
fell from 18% to 12% from 2002 to 2010. However, this figure is still far too high. The introduction of many successful tobacco control measures in Ireland has been facilitated by developments here at European Union level. It's important that our tobacco policy and legislation framework continues to develop within the context of the European Union. Further measures being considered in Ireland include a ban on smoking in cars with children present and the extension of the smoking ban to other public areas such as playgrounds, public parks, sports grounds, educational and health campuses. What we are trying to achieve is to denormalise smoking. We will have an opportunity to review progress by all member states regarding smoke-free environments and tobacco control measures during the Health Informal in Dublin next month. <clears throat> and I do hope that as many of you as can come will be there. I look forward to hearing your opinions today and to working constructively with you, Rapporteur Linda McAvan, and the Shadow Rapporteurs on reaching agreement on this important directive. I have discussed the directive with Commissioner Borg and I'm aware of his personal commitment to ensuring this directive is adopted as quickly as possible. And we do need to adopt it as quickly as possible because with every year another 700,000 of our citizens are going to die. Our legislative and policy framework must continuously be developed to meet the new and ever evolving challenges presented to us and I believe that the current proposal will prove to be crucial in the battle against tobacco-related illnesses in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen of the Parliament, this is about saving lives, it's about protecting our citizens, and it's about shielding our children from this killer habit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, that brings us to uh, our Commissioner for Health. We'll give Mr Flo Borg the floor for 10 minutes. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, Minister Riley, Honourable Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss in a public hearing the revised Tobacco Products Directive. And I know that the European Parliament has been in the forefront since 2009 uh, requesting the Commission to strengthen the EU law on tobacco products for the benefit of European citizens. This is not regulating just for the sake of regulating. This is doing something, as Mr. Riley has said, to reduce the number of smokers in the European Union, which would mean saving lives in the first place. You all know that 700,000 people die prematurely in the European Union alone as a result of smoke-related diseases. Then if there are economic advantages which will ensue from that, much the better. But the main aim remains that of saving people's lives and uh, ensure better, healthier living. And particularly last autumn, the Parliament strongly urged the Commission to act swiftly on this proposal. This is what I did, Mr. Chairman. At my hearing, I promised last November to deliver by the end of January and I managed, with the support of President Barroso and my fellow commissioners, to deliver on the 19th of December. That is six weeks earlier than I had imagined. Now, the current directive is already 11 years old. So it, is time, it was time to bring it in, to line, in line with today's realities and today's scientific and international developments. New tobacco products have appeared on the market, which look like lipstick. I have here... Uh, something which doesn't look like uh, tobacco. It looks like a perfume or a lipstick, and even the colors which are used and the way they are marketed. And then tobacco should not only look like tobacco, it should taste like tobacco as well, not like vanilla or uh, smell like sweets. And why are we saying that it should look and look like tobacco and taste like tobacco? Because, as Mr. Minister Riley said, um, these products are also produced in this way to be attractive to the young. And we know that no one starts smoking at 50, or very rarely does someone start smoking at 50. Usually it is be below the age of 25, and the majority when they are still minors. 
And we have also seen the development of new products like electronic uh, cigarettes. So we had to act and we are acting through this uh, directive. In the meantime, the European Union as a whole, but also the individual member states signed and ratified the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And this means, Mr. Chairman, that we have a legal obligation to comply with its provisions, which cover labeling, flavors, and the fight against illicit trade. So we must bring EU law in line with our international commitments as well. Now, as I said, the Commission's proposal focuses strongly on young people. And I believe regulators have the responsibility to protect and discourage children and young people from taking up smoking. If our intention is to reduce the number of smokers in the European Union by 2% over the next five years, that is 1.2 million smokers less, we have to do two things. One, persuade young people not to start smoking. And secondly, persuade those who already smoke to quit smoking. And young people start smoking because they think it is cool. And they think that, after all, you can stop at any time you want. And many of us, and I know that there are some of us even on this table, who are ex-smokers here know what I am talking about. Then people continue to smoke because they become addicted. We sometimes ignore the addictive nature of tobacco. And therefore, they do not manage to quit. Then, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, smoking translates itself into cancer, heart attacks, and so many other health problems. This is the reality for the 700,000 people who die prematurely every year because of smoke-related diseases. This is like wiping out every year uh, the population of an entire city like Frankfurt or Palermo. And this is why we need to regulate tobacco products in a way that reflects what these products do to people's health. If you look at a pink package with cute elephants on it, like this product which is on the market, and the product tastes or smells like fruit, we even have pina colada uh, cigarettes as well. Will you be able to judge that you are buying a harmful, addictive uh, product? This is the point. Tobacco products should look and taste like tobacco products, and they should not be masked by fancy designs or disguised by flavors. They should not be deceptive. And that is why what the Commission proposal is all about. So first, the proposal seeks to ensure that tobacco products contain adequate information about their impact on health so that people can make informed choices. This could be or could look like a shocking uh, picture. But it's important to introduce shocking pictorial warnings, as some of the member states, I believe 13 member states, have already done so. Today it is discretionary after this proposal uh, comes into force with the approval of Parliament and the Council, it will become mandatory. So 75% of the cover of this tobacco um, product, 75% will have to show warnings, pictorial and otherwise. Uh, we also propose that there are no promotional elements on tobacco products and no attractive lipstick-shaped packages. My aim is that when people look at a tobacco product, they get a very clear message that this product will damage their health. Then it is up to each and every person to decide whether or not to consume the product. We are not prohibiting smoking inside the European Union, but we are making uh, the smokers or those who are tempted to smoke know what they are doing. And around 30% of the package would still remain for trademarks, and the proposal, however, enables member states to put in place, if they want to, on a discretionary basis, plain uh, packaging, which, as you know, is not plain at all. It's, uh, a packet full of uh, warnings, and all the train themes are written in the same way. Now, turning to ingredients, we propose that tobacco products with a characterizing flavor, for example, a strong aroma like vanilla or menthol, should not be allowed. So it's not all flavors 
or additives which will be prohibited, which will be prohibited but the characterizing flavors as these are particularly attractive for young people and make it easier to start smoking. Potentially misleading additives such as caffeine or vitamins should not be allowed in tobacco products either. The pro proposal does not regulate additives necessary to manufacture tobacco products such as sugar needed to make barley or oriental tobacco palatable. As such, the proposal does not discriminate between tobacco varieties. In addition, we propose that any product which increases toxicity or addictiveness is not allowed on the market. More work is needed in this area and we are closely following discussions on toxicity and addictiveness in the World Health Organization. Some other issues, Mr. Chairman, to your indulgence. First, we propose to maintain the ban on SNUS. And I would like to remind the Members of Parliament that when Sweden acceded to the European Union, it was given a concession to allow SNUS inside, European, inside Sweden on the condition that it is not marketed in the European Union. So it was a quid pro quo. The concession was only allowed under the condition that it is not marketed in the European Union. And the ban was in place before Sweden entered the European Union. It was in place for over 20 years. It was confirmed by Parliament and the Council in 2001, and it was further confirmed by a judgment of the European Court of Justice in 2004. SNUS is addictive, has adverse health effects, is increasingly sold in Sweden in packages and flavours targeting young people, um, and has great market growth Potential. So these are the attractive packaging or presentation of SNUS, even with um, such enticing names as Radical Red. I don't think it has a political connotation. It's just that it sounds cooler to describe something as Radical Red. And there is no compelling evidence either that SNUS helps people to quit smoking. In Canada, the number of smokers has gone down to 19%. In California, 12% and the United States 20% without the use of SNUS. Second, for electronic cigarettes, our proposal foresees that products above a certain nicotine threshold should require market authorization under pharmaceutical legislation, as is currently the case in about half of the member states. Below that nicotine threshold, it would be enough to have a health warning. And this approach removes the differential treatment of electronic cigarettes and nicotine replacement therapies. We propose reinforced label, labeling and ingredient rules. And finally, the proposal foresees measures against illicit products, including a tracking system and a security system within the tobacco product itself. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we are not interfering with people's choices. Rather, we aim to protect the vulnerable, the children and young people, an objective fully in line with the legal basis of the proposal. And with that comment, I would augur a smooth and swift adoption of this important piece of legislation during the current parliamentary mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So now we'll have the debate. The first speakers will be the coordinators and the uh, rapporteur, and the shadow rapporteurs, of course. The first speaker, well, I'm going to have to limit you to two minutes, I'm afraid, because otherwise we won't uh, be able to get everybody in. But uh, I know it's unfair, but there's no other way to do it. So, uh, Linda McAvan, two minutes. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Commissioner and to the Minister for coming here today. Well, my main aim here today is to listen to the speakers and to listen to colleagues who take the floor. Um, so I'm going to be very brief at this stage and say that um, I welcome the fact we have this directive on the table. All the coordinators from all the political groups worked very hard to make sure we got this directive in time to be dealt with in this parliament. And both the minister and the commissioner have said why it's such an important um, directive. Because... I don't think even the most hard, hardened smokers want to see 
more young people smoking. All the surveys show that smokers do not want their children to start smoking, and the aim of this directive is to stop that happening, to recruit, recruit fewer and fewer smokers. And so, for me, the measures which are proposed in the directive are good ones, and I'll be seeking to um, strengthen them from the public health perspective. Um, there'll be many issues we'll have to discuss. In the, some new issues we have to discuss, the role of e-cigarettes I know is controversial, different trends in different member states. I know there'll be discussion on the issues of packaging and flavourings, and we'll be taking evidence from different countries where different measures have been proposed. But um, I look very much forward to this debate. Um, I remind all members here that we do have the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, mentioned by both the Minister and by our Commissioner. I, as a rapporteur, we're working within the context of that convention and therefore will be limiting my contact with business to the way the convention suggests, which is to have public meetings with the industry, which will be minuted and recorded, and remind all MEPs that you too are bound by the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And you too, if you meet the tobacco industry and the upstream and downstream users, should also be meeting in a public way, recording those meetings, and making sure you're transparent about who you meet. So, um, so I look forward to the debate over the next few months and to listen to colleagues, and as I said, to see this as a very important measure to, to promote public health in Europe. Vielen Dank. An die Thank you very much. Karl-Heinz Florenz. That's good. Yes, I'll try and keep my comments brief. Commission, at Presidency, I've been uh, following these issues for a number of years, particularly the uh, uh, issues of the chemicals that are used. Now, you're limiting the chemicals to the characteristic aromas, the uh, flavorings. Why didn't you simply ban the... Uh, uh, highly dangerous, toxic uh, additives. The next speaker would be Frédéric Ries. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. I would uh, absolutely agree with what Mrs. McGavin said. I'd also like to thank her for her uh, commitment. And I think that uh, we've been working so far with a, a very good spirit of uh, openness and cooperation among the uh, rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs. Now, Minister, Commissioner, we know that you're closely involved in these issues. Mr. Riley, you've worked closely with Commissioner Byrne on these issues a decade ago. Um, we already know how involved Ireland is in these issues. You have best practice for uh, public spaces, and you uh, touched upon the sacrosanct issue of subsidiarity. Well, indeed, it is occasionally difficult to uh, try and... Uh, uh, get the uh, measure through the subsidiarity test. Now, Commissioner, at your hearing we had the, uh, the question of uh, if tobacco was to be introduced today, it, would, it, it wouldn't get through the test and it would be banned. So you're looking at, uh, at additives which make the toxic product even more toxic, so I think we should be radical here. I'm not the most radical person here, but I think that uh, we... We're tracing up every last gram of horse meat, but at the same time, you've got uh, uh, quite a, 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 a deadly issue here. So we need to be very careful. We need to be very attentive at, to all of the measures you're proposing. I won't go into the technical details right now, but I have two questions to ask you. Uh, one, for, uh, first of all, for Mr. Riley uh, on the uh, strategy rather than the politics. Minister, what do you expect? I mean, you've already uh, heard some uh, reticences from the uh, member states uh, with regard to the proposal that the Commission has put forward. Poland, for example, uh, which we uh, think will be followed by some other countries. Now, the Par European Parliament is one question, but it's a totally different kettle of fish in the member states. So well, what do you think we can expect? And... Uh, Chairman, I'm, I'm bringing my remarks to a close. We've uh, got terrible figures for the effectiveness of our legislation over the last 10 years. Well, we can only do our best, but we really need campaigns. 
Canada, New Zealand, Australia are interesting uh, examples. They need cam uh, campaigns to get to young people and women. Karl Schluter will be the next speaker. He's the shadow rapporteur for the Greens. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. I mean, you have come a good way in your proposal, even if we would still ask for plain packaging to be mandatory. And I think the trademark argument is really weak. I mean, what, val what value does a trademark have that murders millions of people all over the globe? So take it away from the package and we don't see it anymore. It's the best option anyway. And then also on, on additives... It's good. No characterizing flavors. I would be even happier if you got rid of them. Why, why should we add any flavors to tobacco? It's, we shouldn't help them sell more cigarettes. Uh, let's talk about how we can minimize that. And then also, of course, coming from Sweden, the snooze issue. For those who are not Swedish, you won't understand why it's so important, but it was one of the conditions we had when we joined. However, I'm one of the few Swedes who do not want to export this product all over Europe. I think we shouldn't spread bad habits. Nicotine in any form is bad, and therefore I also want to have a regulation on e-cigarettes and not let the market completely lose, because nicotine is extremely heavy drug on, regarding dependency. It's very, very strongly dependent. It makes you dependent. So... so I think any kind of nicotine must be regulated in a strict way. And then finally, on the, on the um, uh, packaging, I'm, I'm happy that you want to ban small packages, slim cigarettes, and all those kind of marketing toys and gimmick. And then the last thing I would really like to get rid of is the point of sale uh, advertising that is still around Europe very prevalent. So if we could get rid of that, we might help some hundred thousands of people not to start smoking, and if we have, like in Australia, mandatory toll-free quit smoke line numbers on the packages and so on, we might help some people actually to stop smoking also. And I think that's really beneficial to Europe's health and economy. Uh, to smoke is bad for your health, but also for your neighbor's health and for your baby's health and for your friend's health and your colleague's health, and it's bad for the economy. So every single smoke we can help stop is a good investment. Vielen Dank. Dann Anna Ross Thank you very much. Anna Rosbach uh, for the ECR. Vorsitzende, ich werde es auf Dänisch machen. Så nu har alle indtil nu været politisk meget korrekt, især når jeg lige lytter til kollega Karl Slytter. Så jeg vil have lov til at... I listen very carefully to Karl Slytter, Mr. Chairman. We've been quite PC about this so far, so I'd like to play devil's advocate for a while. One can for example, drive one's car, but even if you're drunk or don't know how to drive, you can drive, but you're not allowed to smoke in your car now, apparently. Are you really willing to give up the revenue that tobacco generates? It's one of the main sources of treasury revenue in Denmark. So there's a good deal of hypocrisy here, I believe, because... Everyone needs to be protected from smoking on the one hand, but let's not forget that national treasuries need tobacco-generated revenue. I am playing devil's advocate here, let me remind you. And I'm doing this quite deliberately. I also, obviously, want to save people's lives. But the fiscal impact is something we have to bear in mind as well. The problem isn't so much tobacco, it's nicotine-based products that are problematic. And of course I don't advocate their use at all. But I don't want us to work purely on the basis of banning stuff. Let's try informing people as well. We are talking largely about adults. It's up to them to decide whether they want to smoke or not, if they want to do anything that has an impact on their health. We all know it's unhealthy. Everybody knows it's unhealthy. But is it really the European Union's job to ban this product or that? Is that what the European Union's role is? Whether we're talking about alcohol or whatever. I think we need to be very cautious in what we do. Thank you. Mr. Rossi, please. Sì, grazie, Presidente. Ma innanzitutto, caro. Thanks, Chairman. First of all, Chairman, Commissioner, let me ask you whether you think it's appropriate that in the Commission's official document all you've got is this no smoking logo. 
I don't know whether that's right and proper because the idea is that we listen to everybody involved. Surely, on official document of the Commission, we shouldn't actually have a one-sided presentation. I think it's um, something which runs counter to the rights of people, including to the people invited here this afternoon. Secondly, I don't smoke. I've never smoked. But nor do I think we should actually ban people who do smoke. So I agree with what Mrs. Hosback has just said, because I'm concerned that if too many limits are placed and too many tens of thousands of people we're talking about, limits are placed upon them, I think you might end up promoting illegal cigarette trafficking. And without anyone checking what's in these contraband cigarettes, who knows what will be in them? I wouldn't be at all surprised that 99% will end up coming from China. Who is going to be checking what additives are going to be in there and whatever was sprayed on the tobacco plants to grow them in the first place? So I'm asking you, Commissioner, 16% of our cigarettes in Europe today are illegal. Who's checking them? Who's guaranteeing their quality? And if we're then talking instead about information campaigns for young people, I totally agree with that. Smoking is bad for you. As I say, I've never smoked. But infringing on people's personal freedom, I don't think that's what the European Union ought to be doing. Otherwise, we should be doing it with alcohol. All alcoholic beverages and drugs as well, whereas some colleagues say that we ought to liberalise our drug policy. And we can't just keep changing our mind and doing things differently all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Anderen speaking for the GUI group. Um, without doubt, there's no other consumer product um, legally available on the market which kills when used exactly as the manufacturer intends it to be used. And I was quite pleased to hear what Minister Riley said about the Tobacco Product Directive being your top priority during the Irish Presidency. And Minister, to that end, I would ask you for the remainder of the Presidency what initiatives you have in place uh, to drive that forward. Because uh, obviously, as Shadow Rapporteur, I would be very keen to be following those. And as Shadow Rapporteur, obviously, I want to um, associate myself with the Rapporteur's comments about being bound very much by the Framework Convention. And I will be honouring that in the way that was outlined earlier. And I would like to see the Tobacco Product Directive strengthened um, in line with the, the public health perspective. And therefore, I would concur with comments that was made earlier with regards to the need for plain packaging being mandatory. I would like to ask the Commissioner, because I have a concern with regards to a possible dead hand being put on this as we try to move it through this mandate, I intend, and I know other rapporteurs intend, to ensure that that doesn't happen and that we get it through this mandate uh, before the end of the session. But in the event of some obstacles being put in our way, I would like to ask you for some comment with regards to the ramification of that, if that was extended in, unfortunately, to 2014. But I want to make the point very, very clearly that I, as Shadow Rapporteur, do not intend to, uh, to allow that to happen and to use whatever power I can to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Now, we've got so many colleagues on the list that I'll just try and read them all out in order. Peter Liese, François Grostet, Scotta, yeah. uh, then McGuinness, then Gebrandi, Wilmot, Sanoni, Westlund, Florence, hatten wir schon, uh, Fjellner, Thun and Hohenstein, then Klaas, Franco and Ayuso. Have I forgotten So, have I forgotten anyone? And then would I bitten. Okay. So, one minute each, you ask a question, otherwise we won't get through. 
we do need uh, some time for the answers to the questions, so one minute each. So, first speaker is Mr. Kumut Sarkos. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner and Minister, for having uh, kicked off today's hearing. The idea of the directive we're talking about is to strike a balance between improving the external market's functioning and protecting public health. That's to say, protecting public health as a fundamental duty and also making sure that the market and competition work properly. And that's also a, a principle which we follow. We need to stop falling into the trap of any kind of fundamentalist approach to this. I've listened to some of the ideas that have been mentioned, but there's one particular point I wanted to make on slim panatellas with less than 7 millimetres in diameter. If we are serious about stopping smoking and we've got some categories, why aren't we leading, leaving that category out? You never see small children smoking slims, and, and isn't that one way of dealing with this matter? Mrs Grostet, please, one minute. Mrs Grostet? Sorry about that. I was just uh, listening to the, uh, the end of the last speaker on the interpreting. Now, uh, I'll be very brief. First of all, on e-cigarettes, the idea is that these will uh, get people initiated into smoking. Well, you're talking about uh, setting nicotine levels... but these e-cigarettes have much higher nicotine levels, so I was just wondering what your opinion is on those. Secondly, on the flavours, this is supposed to incite young people to smoke as well, it would seem. It seems that uh, menthol is not cons uh, considered to be particularly attractive for young people these days. So do you have any scientific data to support all of that? That's what I'm interested in, because we're talking about uh, mental cigarettes not being very attractive. Yeah. Peter Lisa. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman, Commissioner, Minister. Thank you very much for your uh, introductions. You're both from the EPP group. You've spoken out in favour of uh, a good level of he health uh, protection, and that's something I'm grateful for. I support the basic idea, and I think it's excellent that we have uh, plenty of time to discuss everything. Now, first of all, Now, I'd like to see a lot more uh, reference to passive smoking here, particularly passive smoking uh, when children are, ex are exposed. We know just how dangerous smoking is p for children. Maybe not everybody is aware of it, though. So maybe in co-decision we could have some particular uh, warning statement that we could use. Then... Mrs. Grosted also mentioned e-cigarettes. I've heard from many uh, citizens that they use e-cigarettes so that they don't uh, use normal cigarettes. So in a way, it's a kind of harm reduction. Maybe we could see it from the perspective of harm reduction. Mr. Guter, uh, one minute. Yes, Scotter. Mr. Scotter, sorry, for one minute. Commissioner, colleagues, although I agree with the goal of the proposal to make consumers more aware of the impact of smoking on their health, I still think it's vital that we don't forget the economic aspects which underpin the sector. At European level, we talk about supporting S and SMEs. And there's also the problem of the counterfeiting of European products. The idea of protecting consumers in the European Union shouldn't blind us to the jobs that will be lost. Having general, generic packaging, for example, will make it easier for frauds to take place with impacts not simply on sellers, but also the treasuries of member states themselves. So over and, uh, we need to look at this again because 
we rin, run the risk of, in fact, increasing health risks for people because counterfeit and counter and illegal cigarettes can come in and no one knows what's actually in them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs McGuinness, please. Thank you, Chairman, um, and my thanks to the Commission and the Presidency for their intervention. Um, I think it would be quite uh, alarming um, if we decided, based on the comments of my friend Mr Rossi and others, to stop shielding our children from this killer habit because of our concerns about the economic consequences of job losses in the tobacco sector. But I do see the, um, how wide this debate is. We know that cigarettes kill. We want, I think those of us that have children, that they will not start smoking, and it's our duty to legislate for that. We do need to look at the illicit trade, but let's not say we cannot take action to prevent people starting to smoke because of our concerns about the illicit trade. We need action on both fronts, uh, and therefore I am concerned, and I think Mrs. McEvan was correct to talk about the lobbying activities of those who want to see smoking continue. Uh, let's heed her warning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Gabrandi, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Commissioner, for um, making your proposal. I'm a strong supporter of very stringent policy towards smoking. Um, I think it reflects very well also the societal, the changes in societal attitude towards smoking. My question, though, is, is extremely concrete. Um, do you believe that, on the one hand, the European Commission can propose very stringent um, measures against smoking, and on the other hand, keep supporting the subsidies to the production of tobacco? I think those two are uh, very difficult to defend from one college of commissioners, so maybe you can reflect on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wilmot. I welcome the proposals, but for my mind, they don't go far enough. I'd like to see standardized packaging. And uh, I think as far as the branding is concerned, it's the last place that tobacco producers can advertise their wares that kill one in two of users. So I don't think we should worry about that, and I think we should have plain packaging as they have done in Australia. Uh, I welcome the fact that flavorings like vanilla are going to be banned, but what about things that make burly tobacco palatable. I think we should ban them also. If tobacco isn't very nice to taste, it isn't very nice to taste, and that should be an end to it. And uh, I also think it's outrageous that the same uh, College of Commissioners subsidise tobacco on the one hand when we're trying to deal with it as a public health issue on the other. And finally, people at work have a right to work in a smoke-free atmosphere. And it isn't the Commission's problem, but it is the Parliament's problem that we still have members in this House who subject workers to smoke in the members' bar in Brussels and in Strasbourg, and it is a disgrace. Andrea Sanoni. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Let me thank the Minister and the Commissioner for coming this afternoon. I think the Commission's proposal is a valuable one and it goes in the right direction. 70,000 people dying every year is an awful lot. And we need to do something to save our children, but we need also to protect all citizens in the European Union, those who smoke directly, but those who smoke passively, involuntarily. We need to provide information campaigns via TV and the internet and at schools to make sure that we provide useful information so that people can make choices in full awareness of the facts. Let me ask our guests what they think about this, what I think is a vital campaign and the whole question of passive smoking. I think we need to do far more than this proposal asks us to do. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Also, Westland, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, my question is a simple one. Why isn't the EU Commission respecting the Swedish exception? Well, if you're uh, also uh, banning additives to snooze, 
you're also banning most uh, Swedish snooze. So uh, I think you're basically getting around the Swedish exception. And you're also talking about uh, the, 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 encouraging new users through snooze. Well I, well, I think the facts are very different, in fact. I don't know if you've got any scientific evidence to prove that that uh, in invites people to do it. Christopher Schvelner. Exactly what Osa Westlund just said. But okay, you want to keep the ban on snooze. It's not carrots. It's not good for you. The best thing is not to use tobacco at all. But it is the least harmful tobacco product and accidentally the only one banned. And that is undisputed. The Royal College of Physicians noted that it was between 100 and 1,000 times less harmful than smoking. Imagine the reaction if we would have banned French red wine but allowed vodka. Especially as here in Brussels, I'm able to buy traditional Moroccan tobacco, bizarrely alike snooze, called makla. It's produced in Belgium. And that is not being understood in Sweden. You had the opportunity to regulate all smokeless tobacco, the same, tough, but you missed that, and I would like to know how and why. You look to California, New Zealand, and Canada. Good, but you could look closer to home. If you look at Sweden and Norway, you would see it has the best statistics in the world when it comes to reducing tobacco-related harm, and it actually allowed for choice. It didn't ban snus. Thank you very much. Mrs. Thunen Hohenstein, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I think that we need to consider the uh, uh, health aspects here. We need to protect yo young Europeans. Now, it, people in Krakow are saying we're enter they're basically interfering with their private lives by telling them what to do. If you're talking about vanilla and menthol and all of this, well, a, what about the links with uh, alcohol and uh, illegally brewed alcohol and things like that? I mean, I think we're creating a massive prohibition market. Yeah, thank you. Genau da, da. Mrs. Klass, yes. Well, we're talking about protecting young people here. Well, but we need to inform them and let them decide for themselves. But we know that uh, anything that you ban suddenly becomes very interesting to people. And I think that we've seen that the, uh, the measures that are used to d deter people actually tend to be an attraction to people. Now, how are we going to prevent trade between Europe and uh, uh, non-European sources if all packets look the same. We're talking about five million jobs, we're talking about uh, millions, but uh, t millions in tax income, but the tobacco is legal at the end of the day. Oui, merci, uh, merci, monsieur. Mr. Franco, thank you very much, Minister, Commissioner, but I just wanted to say a few words here. Some uh, colleagues have taken very strong positions, others more moderate positions. But I don't want to be too excessive. Now, people are pointing at uh, tobacco as a, a problem, but uh, it seems that the same is true of uh, uh, beef and pretty much any food products. It seems we shouldn't consume anything at all these days. Now, I do agree this is a major issue issue for young people, but it's basically the people who want to do it will end up doing it anyway. The people who are telling us they want to ban tobacco pretty much are also telling us we should be legalizing cannabis, so we need to find the, the right approach here. When it comes to menthol, we need ob objective scientific data because it's not there at the moment, so I would certainly uh, uh, agree with what my Polish colleague just said. Thank you, Chair. Cigarette smoking is bad for public health, but it's good for the public coffers. I believe that Article 14 of the Directive is not in line with the protocol for eliminating illicit trade in 
tobacco from 2012. 26 of the 27 EU member states have signed up to this uh, protocol, everyone except Cyprus. Article 14 could be an opportunity to tackle this problem. I have a question for the Commission. Does it agree that we need a single code for the product that is vetted by public authorities and full information that allows real-time detail on trade and circulation into bad tobacco products. We need information on the uh, legal status of the products. And this information needs to be available for any checks to be carried out. Would it be possible to make the necessary amendments uh, to Article 14 to deal with problems such as fraud? Thank you. Rebecca Harms. Thank you, Chair, Minister, Commissioner. My group welcomes the proposal that has been tabled. We are delighted that this proposal has finally been made. We would not question your analysis of the health damage that smoking causes. We would like you and this committee to look at the vested interests in the tobacco market. It is a well-endowed, well-organized lobby that is working against the Commission proposal. We sense that there is great power working against the proposal. This is driven by the huge profits made uh, through sale of tobacco products. You just need a bit of raw material and you compare the cost of the raw material with the price charged for cigarette products and you can see the huge profit margin. The public coffers derive their share as well of that profit margin. And I think all these issues need to be made transparent so that we're aware of what we're dealing with. And I also have another question or comment that uh, follows on from what uh, Mr. Lisa said about e-cigarettes. Would e-cigarettes help to uh, steer people away from harmful cigarettes? Why should we make it more difficult or more expensive for them to purchase these e-cigarettes? Thank you very much for that quick question. We'll now hand back to the panel for answers. I'd just like to underscore the point made about e-cigarettes. I have had a lot of input from former smokers about e-cigarettes. They told me that it was the way they managed to kick the habit. It starts with 24 milligrams and then gradually is reduced, but the 4 milligrams uh, that's currently in the proposal would be hit by a ban. Now, nicotine is not a medicinal product, but it should perhaps be sold in a chemist as a medicinal product. So perhaps you could tell us how we should tackle this problem. What would be your line of thinking on the matter? It is a, trif a difficult issue and has uh, led to a lot of questions and controversy. But I'll hand over first to the Irish Minister for Health to field answers to those questions, and then I'll hand over to Mr Borg. Minister, you have the floor. And thank you everybody for your contributions and I understand that this is a, a big issue for some countries that are tobacco producers and depend on it from an economic perspective. But I'd just like to go through the speakers and thank uh, Linda McAvan for her support uh, and Carl Hines Florence who's why don't we ban the toxic ad additives as well. I would like uh, the Commissioner to answer that. but. It's been very clear that this is a compromise directive that doesn't go far enough for many people, and I have to say including myself, but I'm prepared to live with reality. The pragmatism of politics requires that we move this on if we're going to make any progress at all. If we design, you'll forgive the British mark, uh, Rolls-Royce that will sit on a shelf and never go anywhere, or we can go for something that we can get on the road as quickly as possible. And when there are 700,000 people dying every year in Europe, we have to move as quickly as possible. Uh, so Member Rees asked what I expect from Member States, and you mentioned particularly Poland. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that the Polish Health Ministry has said that 90,000 Polish people die every year from cigarette-related, tobacco-related illness. 
that's a huge number of Polish people. There is a way of, of creating an economy outside of tobacco. This initiative will take many years to have a huge effect. There's plenty of time to change, and I think as an EU, perhaps we should look at how we can help economies that are very dependent on tobacco to move away from that. Because we do not want a situation where it's a choice between jobs or lives. I don't think that that's a choice that we should ever have to make. Lives always come first. Carl Schleiter talked about the brown packaging and regulating nicotine, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but again, we, we want to get consensus here, and I believe what we have in this directive is the quickest way forward. Anna Rosbeck talked about smoking banning cars. It's not uh, about banning smoking in cars. It's about banning smoking in cars where children are present, strapped in, trapped, unable to get out with smoke, which is <laughs> a carcinogen swirling around their heads. Uh, it's, and it's not largely about adults. This is actually about children. Adults have free choice. They can smoke if they wish. We do not want to interfere with their private space. But they do not have a right to smoke and harm others in the course of their habit. And I think we would, most people, right-minded people would agree with that. And children are below the age of, uh, legal age of consent when they start smoking. So what choice are they exercising? And then they're addicted. And what choice have you then when you're addicted? None. Uh, and Mr. Rossi who talked about banning people who smoke. We're not banning people who smoke, and we're not anti-smoker. We want to help smokers, but what we are is anti-smoking. And enforcement, which you mentioned, is always going to be an issue. We're not infringing on people's rights, but rather enshrining and protecting the rights of others, children in particular. Uh, Martina Anderson, I'd like to thank her for her support. And you talked about what other initiatives we would uh, take to strengthen the situation. Um, we're going to have 10 more meetings on this subject during our presidency. And I will have the opportunity next week to meet with many of the ministers. And I'll take every other uh, opportunity I have to consult with them and to encourage them to support this and to get their governments to support it and realize that there is a better way for an economy to progress than selling a carcinogen. Um, it's Kumas Dakos talked about slims are aimed uh, and are not aimed at young people. That's precisely whom they're aimed at. That's advertising, ladies and gentlemen. It looks attractive. It's nicely packaged. It's even got a nice name on it of a well-known magazine. That's reality. That's what it does to you. That's what we want people to understand when they open a packet of cigarettes, what it does to you and to those around you if, 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 if you don't protect them. Um, can I just say that um, Peter Lees talked about the flavours and the data, so, sorry, sorry, you mentioned about passive smoking, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. We do need to have more warnings around smoking and the effects of passive smoking. There was another uh, contributor who talked about flavours and data to support it here, I think. Um, can I just say that I don't have the data, perhaps, around flavours, but I'm absolutely damn sure that the cigarette companies do, and that's why they're doing it. Uh, thank you. Can I just say, um, so I'm ask, um, yeah, Mr. S Mr. Scotta, uh, the fraud issue and the economic consequences. Well, I mean, this is an economic no-brainer. This costs. So we raised 20 billion from tobacco in the EU. We spend 23 billion on people's health, and we lose another 8 billion through, as I mentioned in my speech, absenteeism, early retirements. It's a no-brainer, but it's also a no-brainer ethically and it's a no-brainer morally. And who in this room wants to be talking to your children in 20 or 30 years' time and say, you didn't act when you knew? And that's why someone you know, you love, you cherish, is lying, dying in a bed from a cancer related to cigarette smoking. Uh, can I just thank Marie McGuinness for her support? And can I also mention the issue of fraud? Well, within the directive, there is tracking and security provisions as well. That will reduce that. And Glenis Wilmot, I, I agree, you know, we, we could go further, but as I've said, I think we have to do what we're capable of doing and accept that, you know, this would be a major step forward. I would love to go much further, but I have to be a realist. And you're absolutely right. Tobacco, in most instances, doesn't taste good, and that's your body senses telling you you shouldn't smoke because it's not good for you. Uh, Mr. Zanoni talked about doing more, and I was with Westland talked about why not exclude snooze from the directive. 
um, and Mr. Fellner the same, saying it's less harmful. Well, in relation to that, as, as the Commissioner has said, they don't have snooze in California or Canada, and they brought down their smoking uh, statistics. And I would consider, you know, this idea of something is less harmful than another, therefore it should be encouraged. Quite the contrary, I mean, I don't think anyone here would recommend somebody drive on three ball tires rather than four ball tires. So, um, can I just say, uh, so Van Hootsen said we're interfering with the private life of people, we're not. I've covered that point already. I've made it very clear, people, adults particularly, we're not about in any state. People can do as they wish in the privacy of their own home, but they can't be damaging other people's health in the process. Um, and Krista Class informed them and let them decide. I've covered that. How can children be in a position to decide? And then they're addicted. It's too late. Gaston Franco talked about beef being like tobacco. Well, apart from the fact that they've, you know, both are agricultural endeavours, there's nothing remotely uh, uh, similar. And I'm certainly not asking anyone to legalise cannabis. Uh, Pilar Ayuso said it's bad for people, but it's good for coughers, and it's good at making a lot of more people cough. Um, so, not good for those coughers. Um, Rebecca, sorry, Harms, and, and Mr. Grote, you talked about e-cigarettes and the pharmacists. Well, yeah, we, we, should, we should really regulate them, though, and we should have them as an aid to people to give up cigarettes. And, and the best chance you have of quitting smoking is under some professional healthcare advice and support. So I, I, can I just finish, and thank you very much for your indulgence, by saying, if a new drug was discovered in Europe that could save 100,000 lives a year, everybody in this parliament would be screaming for it to be made available to our people. Yet here we have an initiative that could save 700,000 people's lives a year. So I hope you'll see it in that light. I want to say, you know, if it were discovered today, there's no question, but it wouldn't be legalised. And as others have said, I have yet to meet a smoker who wanted their child to be a smoker. And I'll just finish by saying it's not an any state. We believe in people's rights to make their own decisions and their own choices, but they must not be allowed to harm others, particularly minors, when they do that. So again, I hope the Parliament will feel fit to support this initiative and help us get it through so that we can look back with some pride and say we were part of an initiative that saved hundreds of thousands of lives over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for that very striking statement. You really drummed home the points in your concluding remarks. You really brought home what this legislation proposal is all about. I'd now like to hand over to Commissioner Borg to answer questions raised by colleagues. Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I enjoyed this debate. It was a lively debate with opposing views. Those who have said that this directive does not go too far and those who believe that we have gone too far. So applying the Aristotelian golden mean criterion, probably we're on the right track. And as uh, Minister Riley said, politics is also the art of the possible. You try to do something, propose something which would have the widest uh, consensus rather than going too far or doing too little that you would not have the consensus of anyone. Now, I have attended an, um, a, another co a competitiveness council. I have uh, appeared before the Agricultural Committee and have had questions even on the smoking uh, on the tobacco directive, I am before you today, I've met MEPs, and I know what the different views are, but let's be very careful about certain arguments. For instance, that if we regulate tobacco too much, then this will have a financial consequence on state revenue. So probably the argument is let's promote smoking so that we would replenish the coffers of the state. Or else that if we regulate this tobacco products and succeed in having less smokers in the European Union over a period of five years, we are aiming at 1.2 million less, that will mean losing jobs. So let us promote smoking so that through the increase in the number of smokers, we won't have 
any job losses. On the contrary, let's have a job increase. Let's be very careful about these arguments because they are put forward sometimes with vengeance, sometimes with a certain strength, and in times of economic crisis, they are extremely attractive as well. Do we want to reduce the number of smokers in the European Union? The answer should be yes, which explains perhaps why in this parliamentary document there is a no smoking sign. We are obliged as member states, as European Union, not to promote smoking and to make smoking as unattractive as possible. Of course, we could differ in the means to achieve that end, but the aim is extremely is extremely clear. And can I switch to Italian to reply to some questions which have been made by some Italian MEPs? Questa cosa di libertà di scelta. The question of freedom of choice. What do we do? This is a debate which has been held on various different topics, whether or not, for example, we make it mandatory for people to wear crash helmets on motorbikes or the seat belts in cars. Now you could say, why should we interfere in people's freedom of choice? If somebody wants to die in a car crash or a motorbike crash, that's up to them, surely. If he doesn't want to wear a helmet, that's up to him. That's his responsibility. But the expenditure for treating somebody like that, who's injured in that way, and the other victims, of course, of the traffic accident, who actually ends up paying for that? Well, of course, it's member state governments and, at the end of the day, taxpayers. So, in any society, there are measures which don't ban things, but regulate things. We aren't saying no one must smoke. It's not a question of prohibition in the US with the Volstead Act amending the US Constitution, which prevented marketing, banned marketing and distribution and consumption of alcohol throughout the United States. We're not saying that. We're saying if you want to smoke again, you can. You're free to do so. But we need to make smoking a less attractive option. And that is something that's legitimate. It's something which has been backed up by rulings in the ECJ in Luxembourg and it's up to the individual whether they smoke or not. Language. Will there be any delaying tactics? I have some in mind, but I wouldn't like to make them public, not to encourage uh, the use of these tactics themselves. Um, but it is important that we approve by we, I mean the Council and, and Parliament, because the Commission has only the right of initiative, that we approve this directive during the current parliamentary mandate. Because if we do not, it would mean, under the new parliament, having new appointment of new rapporteurs, and even though the discussion would not have come to a close, it will be prolonged. And even if we approve it in the current parliamentary mandate, all these cigarette boxes, new cigarette boxes, which I have shown you, the 75% mandatory pictorial, will only come, come into effect at the earliest in three and a half years from now, possibly four years. So if we are going to procrastinate even further, after years of, the, of, of Parliament insisting on a revision of the Tobacco Directive, it would mean that the tobacco industry will enrich itself even, even further. Now probably someone will tell you, within this chamber or from outside this chamber, that this directive will not change anything in tobacco consumption. If that is the case, why worry about job losses? Why worry about the loss of, to the coffers of the state? These arguments are being put forward because this directive will make a difference. At least, hopefully, it will make a difference. And because it makes a difference, these arguments will be put forward about the economic consequences 
of reducing um, the number of uh, smokers in the European Union. And may I add one other uh, argument in this, in this debate on this question. It is true that if the number of smokers declines, there will be economic consequences, but not all will be negative. Others will be even more positive and more numerous than the negative ones. Because that would mean not only that the member states will save a lot of public money on the cure of smoking diseases. It also means that those who will quit smoking will use the money which they save in other areas of the economy, creating new jobs as well. I won't go again and burden you with statistics, but uh, Mr. Riley, I think, did that uh, rather, rather well in explaining that even the revenue from the entire tobacco industry of 20 billion is much less than what states um, uh, invest and spend in the treatment of health-related diseases and in the loss of economic productivity. The argument has been put forward that when you prohibit things, they will become more attractive. And it is true that some of the most attractive things in our lives are the ones which are prohibited. But to argue that there will be more counterfeiting following this directive, I think, is, is false because we are introducing for the first time in a mandatory way a security feature and a tracking feature in a tobacco product. This will be the first time that this will be imposed by law. Not to protect the state coffers, but mostly not to allow other cigarette products or tobacco products not in alignment with EU legislation to enter the EU market. Of course, those who export tobacco products to countries outside the European Union are not bound by these rules. These are only rules for cigarette products, for tobacco products within the uh, European Union. Characterizing flavors. Yes, it is a fact that characterizing flavors and also the way that cigarettes are produced and appear as tobacco products influence the decisions which young people, mostly young people, make when they decide to smoke, which is why we are regulating it. Should we prohibit all additives, all flavors? The rule of proportionality indicates that we should prohibit only those characterizing flavors. There's a definition in the directive of what a characterizing flavor is. There will be an independent panel of experts supervised by the Commission within the Member States to decide what is a characterizing uh, flavor. So I do not think that counterfeiting or contraband will increase, uh, particularly in view of the security features and the tracking features as well. Electronic cigarettes. The rule is clear. First of all, these should not be promoted because even though some consider them to be less harmful, they also create a false sense of security. Some people who smoke these electronic cigarettes feel that they have quit smoking because there is no smoke. But they do harm just the same. They give this false sense of security. And if I were to envisage a campaign against smoking, I would include e-cigarettes because they are addictive just the same, they lead you to consume nicotine just the, just the same, and they are regulated in, the, in, the same, in, the, in, in, in this way, that below a certain level it is enough to have a health warning, beyond a certain level, which exists already in other tobacco products, one would need an authorization. Um, I appreciate the comments which uh, Honourable Zanoni and uh, Peter Lees have put forward on passive smoking and uh, to consider, I believe it's already there, but we'll check again, whether to discourage passive smoking and the harms of passive smoking by including in the pictorial warnings or the health warnings a, ref a reference to passive smoking as well. On SNUS, I know now by heart all the arguments put forward in favor of SNUS, even because in the European Parliament magazine there was a special edition in favor of the lifting of the ban. 
And I will not put forward only the legalistic arguments, although the legalistic arguments are very strong as well, because if I give you something on a condition that you accept something else, you can't then remove one condition and allow the concession just the same. The prohibition of snus existed before Sweden joined the European Union. So technically, when Sweden joined the European Union, it should have prohibited snus as well in its own country. But this concession was made for political reasons on the condition that snus is not marketed in the European Union. And prohibiting characterizing flavors in snus would mean also only hitting 10% of the entire production of snus which relies on, on the characterizing flavors themselves. And then how can we prohibit characterizing flavors for chewing tobacco inside the European Union but allow characterizing flavors for snus uh, as well? I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to further debates on this uh, issue. I know that it is a sensitive issue. I know that we all want to reach the same aim, but perhaps have different ways of using which methods to, to reach that aim. I will defend this proposal because I feel that it is a balanced and reasonable approach. It does not lead to a nano-state. It is not regulating people's life uh, in a fundamentalist method. On the contrary, it is a balanced approach. We are not going too far. We are going far enough to reach the aim, which I mentioned at the beginning of my address, of reducing the number of smoking of smokers over the next five years by 2%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your answers, for your statement, final statement. It was also very clear, and uh, we will have a really fruitful debate afterwards uh, during the legislation process. And now we will start with the second panel. And here I want to like welcome Mrs. Florence Bertelletti Kemp, she is Director of Smoke Free Partnership. And uh, next speaker is Mr. Michelin Rilling. He is a member of the board of the Confederation of European Com uh, Community Cigarette Manufacturers. And as first speaker, Mrs. Bertelletti, uh, here's 10 minutes, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished MEPs. Today, I will not give you a presentation of the Smoke Free Partnership and its partners. Instead, I will remind you that together, we represent thousands of doctors, nurses, and patients who often spend many long and painful years in poor health conditions from cancer, cardiovascular, and respiratory diseases. The first point that I would like to make is that the Commission's proposal is good and fair. We are particularly pleased that member states have the possibility to introduce plain packaging, and yes, we would have liked to have seen mandatory plain standardized packaging in the proposal. Secondly, before I address the economic and health burden of tobacco in the EU, which is currently polarized into two camps, on the one hand, the tobacco industry and their allies, and on the other, everyone else, I would like to invite you to step back and recall the events that have surrounded the revision of the Tobacco Products Directive in the past four to five years. As soon as the Australian government made its decision to introduce plain packaging, the issue took center stage in the world of tobacco control. And I'd like now to tell you a story. The parallel with the biblical story of David and Goliath is appropriate. In the past few years, the tobacco industry decided to put its boxing gloves back on. From Uruguay to Australia to Norway, Goliath brought lawsuits against countries that took action to protect the health of their young people. Here, at European level, Goliath started its fight by submerging the public consultation and managed to generate a large proportion of the 85,000 contributions, a record in the history of EU consultation at EU level. Then, the tobacco industry filed a complaint against Mr. Daly. I will not comment on the investigation underway, 
apart from stressing two facts. One, it should be noted that it is a tobacco industry that filed a complaint against the health commissioner. And B, that the EU values of presumed innocence should prevail. So today, on the day of the hearing, I hope we will be able to offer you a good fight. I am happy to be David for a while and to leave the experts to take my place in the second round. Goliath's strongest weapon is to use myths and lies in order to create fear and doubts in your mind. So let's explore some of them. Myth number one, we have not been listened to. Well, let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen. The main reason why the tobacco industry is saying this is because they don't like what's in the proposal. Secondly, despite what they claim, no one is saying that the tobacco industry should be excluded. However, what we are calling for in order to create a level playing field is to have total transparency when meetings take place. And indeed, recent access to document requests reveal that the tobacco industry had meetings to discuss the TPD with officials from the Secretary General and members of Mr. Barroso's cabinet. However, when we asked to get a meeting to discuss the TPD, we were, we were referred back to the Health Commissioner. So, who has been given fair access at the highest level and who has not? As Thomas Jefferson said, there is nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of the unequal. Myth number two, the Tobacco Products Directive measures will create illicit trade. Well, on this topic, I would like you to remember two facts. First, there is considerable evidence that tobacco companies have orchestrated tobacco smuggling for their own commercial interests. And by the way, it is my understanding that Japan Tobacco International is currently under investigation. Second, the tobacco industry rarely defines what it means by illicit trade. So let me briefly tell you, illicit trade falls under four main categories, contraband, cheap whites, counterfeiting, bootlegging. So why do you think they're always framing it as only counterfeiting? Myth number three, we are opposed to regulations that are extreme in nature and are not evidence-based. I will not spend too much time on this. The evidence will be explained in greater details by the experts later on. All I will say is that there is at least a total of 1,096 pages worth of evidence that has been reviewed by many experts on all the measures relating to the TPD. The bottom line is that the tobacco industry, they are not experts in scientific evidence. However, I would grant them to be excellent salespeople. Myth number four, the proposal will harm the economy. Well, as you said, Mr. Borge, this is not very logical. Either they say that the measures are effective and that it will harm the economy, or they say that they are not effective. And if they're not effective, how could they harm the economy? En français, on dit c'est le serpent. Now let's go. Snake biting its tail. Smoking is addictive and a very hard habit to break. The best idea is not to start at all. We know that 70% of smokers start before the age of 18 and 94% before the age of 25. What this means is that about 80 million kids, 80 million people, young people, my, my daughter is in the room, start under the age of 15, are still at risk, and I don't want her to start. The cost to the economy. Tobacco, we have heard, is responsible for 700 deaths in the EU every year. It means 2,000 per day, 80 per hour, one person dying every 45 seconds. It also means 25.3 billion euros in smoking-induced healthcare costs, 7.3 billion euros in productivity losses, 
and 9.94 million lost life years equals 517 billion euros. Now, I would like you to come back to the analogy about the revision of the Tobacco Products Directive and the fight between David and Goliath. You all know that the tobacco industries are a powerful lobby, but do you know exactly how powerful they are? In 2010, the combined profits of the six leading tobacco companies was $35 billion. This was equal to the profits of Coca-Cola, Microsoft, and McDonald's combined. According to the Voluntary Transparency Registry, 97 full-time lobbyists defend the interests of the tobacco in Brussels with a budget of 5.3 million. These figures are only the tip of the iceberg. We, in the Smoke Free Partnership, are only two people working. And those working on tobacco control in Brussels can be counted on one hand. So despite this size, David won. That's the story. That's the point of the story. We won. But what lessons can we draw from this story? Firstly, the story tells us that David won because he was not frightened, even if everyone else was, because he knew we had to fight the giant. I hope you will do, will, 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 will do. Europe is European citizens rely on you to ensure that common sense prevail over corporate interests. Secondly, the story tells us that David won because he believed and he had faith. What you have on your side is the support of the public. This revision is a deeply political and controversial process and a very important issue for the entire EU health community. We know too well that at times of economic hardship and austerity measures, it can be tempting for governments to set public health aside and focus on economic measures. However, this crucial legislation goes to the heart of European economic recovery. It has the potential to improve the health of European citizens, the productivity of its highly skilled workforce, and protecting its young people. Before I give the floor to Mr. Goliath, I would like to thank you for listening to me and would like to leave you with one question. Whatever the tobacco industry will now say to you, will you believe them? Mr. Goliath, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Bertoletti, but I as chair will be handing over to the next speaker. I'll give the speaker a chance to get ready. And when you nod that you are set to go, then you can begin your presentation. Over to you, sir. Members of the Parliament, Commissioner, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Kekem, the Confederation of EC Cigarette Manufacturers, I thank you for the opportunity to present briefly our views on this draft directive. My name is Michiel Rehring. I appreciate it's a difficult name, but it is not Goliath. And I'm a member of the board of Kekem. Cigarettes are associated with serious health risks. Kekem and its members therefore support appropriate, proportionate, and evidence-based regulation of our industry. We do not want children to smoke. And we support effective measures to prevent smoking by minors. As a father of three children, one of whom is incidentally named David, I fully support this position. <laughs> Kekem and its members have contributed with detailed submissions and expert reports to the 2010 public consultation. By and large, the comments that were made at the time are still valid. After publication of the proposal, our further comments were submitted to a consultation by the Irish Government Ministry of Health in January. And I invite you, if you haven't already done so, to read and consider these submissions in full. It is a missed opportunity, however, in our, op in our opinion, that only Kekem has been invited 
and that therefore representatives of the other tobacco-related sectors do not have this chance to share their views. Today I will address the objectives of the proposal and whether these will be met. I will raise the significant economic and social unintended consequences. And as you would expect, there are important legal considerations to take into account as well. And finally, I will talk about the need for dialogue, participation, and transparency. As I mentioned, we support appropriate, proportionate, and evidence-based regulation. However, this proposal will not achieve its stated objectives. It will have unintended consequences, and it will increase the regulatory burden and hence our costs. That is why we are concerned. The Commission proposes to increase the size of warnings on packs. No reliable evidence has been put forward that increasing the size of warnings on packs actually reduces the number of smokers or prevents children from starting smoking. A recent U.S. Court of Appeal decision found that the data put forward to support the introduction of larger graphic warnings in the USA amounted to, and I quote, not a shred of evidence. The same court found that the regulatory impact analysis, and I quote again, essentially concedes the agency lacks any evidence showing that the graphic warnings are likely to reduce smoking rates. This is the same USA impact assessment that the Commission's impact assessment seeks to rely on. Today's consumers in the EU are well aware of the risks associated with smoking. Providing more information to them will not lead to a change in smoking behavior. Again, no reliable evidence has been put forward by the Commission in its proposal to justify prohibiting menthol cigarettes and thin so-called slim cigarettes. And rather than providing alternative products to cigarette users, the proposal maintains the ban on Swedish news outside of Sweden and moves most nicotine-containing e-cigarettes to the pharmaceutical category. The proposal is not a harmonization measure improving the internal market. It does not remove barriers to trade. Instead, it prohibits entire product categories. This does not improve the functioning of the internal market. It imposes restrictions on design and it will reduce significantly our ability to innovate and compete. This does not improve the functioning of the internal market, but it is why we are concerned. It deprives consumers of choice. It is not proportionate. It introduces highly complex measures which will add significant cost for larger and for smaller companies. Finally, it also provides for member states to adopt national measures in areas covered by the proposal as well as areas that are not. This further undermines any purported harmonization. So rather than removing barriers to trade, the proposal will introduce them. It will have serious negative consequences. Smokers of products that will be prohibited overnight will either move to smoking other cigarettes or their demand may be matched by illegal supply. This would be a huge business opportunity for smugglers and counterfeiters. And no hologram or track and trace system will prevent them from capitalizing on such an opportunity. Indeed, why does the proposal introduce these when a protocol under the Framework Convention to address illicit trade has just been adopted? These prohibitions are compounded by the fact that significant numbers of consumers of menthol and thin cigarettes are found in Finland, Poland and Bulgaria, for example, on the eastern borders of the EU. Nevertheless, no proper impact assessment of illicit trade is done by the Commission. Banning innovation and introducing packaging design restrictions will reduce our ability to differentiate our products. This unjustified interference in competition will reduce our ability to sustain premium products. It may create a trend of downtrading to cheaper, lower margin products, and that in turn will lead to lower revenue for governments, retailers, and manufacturers. That's why we are concerned. As I explained, the proposal does not improve the functioning of the internal market. It introduces rather than removes barriers to trade. 
It breaches EU rules on legal basis, proportionality and subsidiarity. The proposal and its lack of reliable evidence are also inconsistent with a number of legal obligations, including freedom of expression and trade, and with protection of intellectual property rights. In particular, they are inconsistent with the EU's international trade obligations under the WTO's Technical Barrister Trade and TRIPS IP property treaties. <coughs> Finally, I will turn to allegations that the industry I represent is not a legitimate stakeholder in the EU legislative process. Article 11 of the EU treaty provides for strong processes for interacting with associations and civil society. I appreciate that these processes are designed to protect public policy from vested interests, from all vested interests. We comply with the applicable rules, including the European Transparency Initiative and the European Parliament's Code of Conduct for Lobbyists. But we believe that it is important that all stakeholders are consulted, heard, and listened to. And as a representative of KECM today, I only represent KECM member companies. Let me invite you, therefore, to listen also, at an appropriate moment, to the voices of the representatives of the million and a half people whose livelihoods depend fully or partially on tobacco. Before concluding, I invite you to briefly read the slide in front of you. In conclusion, let me again express my appreciation for the opportunity to participate in the hearing today. Listening to Kekem now and in the future to representatives of all other tobacco-related sectors is of crucial importance. We support proportionate and evidence-based regulation. This proposal, however, is neither. In the consultation responses I referred to earlier, KECA member companies have suggested less restrictive, more targeted and proportionate alternatives. For example, measures that really prevent children from buying tobacco products. Highly effective measures that I would be happy to elaborate on at a later stage. If you have any questions on any alternative measures that we have proposed or favor or on any other matter raised in my presentation, I would be happy to address that later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to our colleague Mrs. Rees. No other speakers are on the list, so Frederick Rees, you're going to be the only uh, contributor. Okay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. C'était une. Thanks, Chairman. It's a, ref a question to Mr. Herring, who's just spoken. I agree pretty much with what he said. I, when he talks about the lack of effectiveness on uh, legislation on size of health warnings on cigarette packets, that's why I talked about the necessary awareness raising and information campaigns which has happened in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, etc. But when it comes to the lack of evidence that menthol cigarettes are harmful, there is information on breast cancer which has become extremely high, uh, high death rate, I beg your pardon, lung cancer which has taken over at the top of the cancer list in member states and that is now being linked to those kind of cigarettes. I don't know what uh, studies he's got but they must be different from mine. I do have a question on e-cigarettes which we've been talking about quite a bit this afternoon. Like a series of previous speakers I think it should be a kind of weaning off tool and that means the threshold which we can talk about needs to be needs to reflect reality and I want to be sure that we are talking about a weaning off tool Mr. Severin talked about making sure that children don't part purchase tobacco but given the importance of the uh, share of the market now in terms of e-cigarettes, how can we be sure that in a few years time e-cigarettes don't become some fun 
pop, cool kind of thing, which the industry might come up with to win over people that we're not designed to win over, so that they do strictly remain a weaning off tool. Thank you very much. Linda McAvan, please. Um, my, my questions to um, our speaker from SESM. Um, you said that your, your companies want to stop young people smoking. And I just wondered, are you aware of the recent study by the World Health Organization on the health behavior in school-aged children? Because it's children who start smoking, not adults. But in 14 member states, the prevalence of boys smoking is going up in the last five years. And in nine member states, for 15-year-old girls, the, pre the prevalence is up, particularly in Sweden, actually. Some of the highest figures are coming out of Sweden on this study. And I wonder, are you aware of that study? Last week, we had another hearing, and we were given a figure for the advertising, the amount spent in the United States on advertising by the tobacco industry. And we were told that we don't have a similar figure for the European Union. And I wonder whether you have a figure for the European Union, and if you could share that figure with us. Now, you mentioned a court case. You mentioned the court case in the United States about smoking and the lack of evidence. I wonder, are you aware of the U.S. Surgeon General's 2012 report on preventing tobacco use among youth and adults? I won't give a lengthy quote from it. But um, the, the conclusion is that um, the evidence consistently and coherently points to the int intentional marketing of tobacco products to youth as being a cause of young people's tobacco use. Now, you've seen the packages, both the Commissioner and the Minister have shown this house today, and I wonder if you could tell us who those packages are targeted at. Thank you very much. I'll uh, read off the speaker's list. One minute each. Frau Sommer. Okay, the first speaker is Mrs. Anderson. Uh, thank you. The arguments have been made in relation to um, illicit uh, trade, and therefore my question is to see Sam as well. I am firmly of the view that uh, the tobacco lawyers would move quickly to shut down any copycat operation. So can the representative uh, that spoke here today that was called Mr. Goliath, I know that's not your name, explain the, um, the Smokes Free Partnerships myth too um, and how the illicit trade itself, how that tallies with your own record of alleged involvement in illicit trade of cigarettes there were cooperation agreements between the European Commission and four of the largest tobacco manufacturers signed between 2004 and 2010, and these agreements currently require them to pay out a collective total of 1.65 billion euros to the EU to prevent smuggling of contraband cigarettes as part of a settlement where the European, uh, the European Commission agreed to drop Pending litigation against these tobacco companies. Thank you very much. Mrs. Sommer, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Now, I'm afraid I only managed to hear the closing remarks because I arrived a bit late. Now, I've heard a few comments from the floor talking about a, a, a ban on uh, some of the active ingredients. Do you think that that's uh, really appropriate? You'd, you'd make pretty much every kind of uh, flavoured tobacco uh, company uh, bankrupt. It's not the, the aromas, the flavours that are uh, dangerous to health. As for packaging, the uh, Commission seems to be taking on all sorts of powers here. Is the uh, industry in a position to prevent illegal products from inf uh, basically uh, uh, flooding the market. If I think that, that, uh, I think that there, there are issues with the illegal cigarettes here. And what do you think about the, um, the costs of the traceability system? Fjellner, Next speaker is Christopher Fjellner. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I have one problem, another problem with the text I have in front of me, and that's that I don't think it enough regulates the addictive 
and harmful content of tobaccos. Uh, I, I, I would have been much more comfortable if that would have been the approach rather than addressing the question of taste. There's been many questions on meth menthol, for example, and what's the proof that this, it's the taste that is the difference. I haven't actually heard anybody refer to that scientific data. And, and when I have a hard time finding scientific data, I go to my own experience. When I was young, grr, and tried to smoke, it wasn't because it tasted good, it was because I was stupid. I thought it was cool. And I don't know anybody who's tasted a menthol cig, but it's not the taste question. So I would like to find what is the scientific facts. I haven't heard about that yet. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Mr. Schluter. Oh no, the next speaker is Rebecca Harms. Referred to the a court judgment, I have found many other court judgments saying the opposite, but I don't, I don't know exactly which one you mentioned, but. What is the cigarette manufacturer's position on the fact of the effectiveness of, of, of um, pictorial warnings? If the court judges that it's not a shred of evidence, and you have the 2003 Canada study, you have the 2012 Cantrell study, you have the 2012 South Carolina study, you have the 2012 Rook study from Australia, you have the 2006 meta-analysis of all studies from, uh, from uh, Hammond, and all of them say that it's clearly effective. Or in any case, even if it's not super effective in some cases, it costs nothing, so it's very effective anyway, because even if it helps one, it, it, at a very low cost, it's still useful. So instead of just, uh, maybe the court in the U.S. have too little resources, don't have enough staff, can't check documents, but you have a lot of money in your industry. Do you believe there is not a shred of evidence that these pictorial warnings are effective? Vielen Dank. Last but not least, Rebecca. Thank you. Rebecca Harms, last but not least. Thank you very much. I have a question on a problem which the Parliament and the media have been uh, uh, working on for some time, and that's to say, how many people in the umbrella organisations and your own organisation, uh, how, many, how many people are employed? Now, I... I uh, would be interested to hear what the budget for lobbying work uh, from the tobacco industry here in uh, Brussels is. And I'm wondering why you don't think that uh, y your presence at this hearing is uh, sufficient to re represent your views. Okay, you seem to employ a lot of people as uh, lobbyists. You've been putting a lot of money to try and uh, head off this uh, new directive. Before Thank you very much, Rebecca Harms. Before I give the floor back, I'm going to give the floor to the Commissioner, because he's going to have to leave us afterwards. But he will be back with us on Thursday in a different context. So, Commissioner. Because I have to address the Agricultural Council on the horse meat issue, you know, on the labelling of the horse meat issue. So I would like to clarify s certain points. Um, do we have the right legal basis? Yes, we have, Article 114 and the treaties, which impose on us an obligation to establish high public health standards in internal market policies. So it's Article 114 of the treaty, which is very, very clear on these issues as regards the protection of public health in internal market policies. Secondly, these judgments of the United States, well, there are judgments which say, as Mr. Rearing has said, there are other judgments of courts of equal rank which say the other. We will await the, Amer the American citizens will await the judgment of the uh, Supreme Court. But it will not be a tragedy if the Supreme Court of the United States uh, decides uh, otherwise. I mean, because there are 13 member states in the European Union which have adopted pictorial warnings. If they are found in breach of the US Constitution, I don't think that's a big, uh, that's a big deal. I would be worried if the European Court of Justice were to decide in that way. But if we are in breach of the U.S. Constitution, it's not concern uh, European uh, countries, it concerns American citizens, and even then we do not have a final judgment of the Supreme uh, Court. And those countries which have introduced pictorial warnings, health warnings, even plain packaging, is there any evidence at all that illicit trade has increased. There is no evidence at all that illicit trade has increased as a result of uh, the imposition of these uh, rules regarding
pictorial warnings or health warnings uh, at all. Um, and there have been judgments also of the European Court of Justice that uh, the basis is the correct one, Article 114 is the correct basis, and that it is possible as part of the internal market to introduce rules relating uh, to health protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Well, it is good that we had such high-level uh, representation from the uh, Commission. And uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, answering the uh, questions that were raised. So thank you very much once again for being with us today. Now I'd like to go back to the experts, give them the floor, ladies first. You have five minutes. Questions of our colleagues, please. I think I will be shorter because actually most of the questions were not addressed to myself. But um, there was one question about the effectiveness of graphic warning uh, by Mrs. Rees, and I would like to quote just one, uh, one study which is nonetheless extremely important. Uruguay introduced graphic warning 80% at the back and the front. And in the year that that happened, there was a reduced consumption by young people uh, of 8%. And uh, for the overall population, it was actually 4.3%, uh, which is more than the 2% uh, that uh, the, the, we expect to have with the, the measures. And so it clearly uh, shows that it is effective. It reduced uh, consumption by young people and by the general population. And the way we can know this is because Argentina, which is the country next to Uruguay, had an increase instead of a decrease, whilst they had not introduced any measures. So I suppose this is my, my conclusion. I'll be very short. And I'm sure the experts in the second round will be able to provide more evidence afterwards. Thank you very much. Mr. Rehring, please. Thank you. I indeed have uh, most of the questions and I will uh, seek to answer them in turns. Ms. Ries asked a question around the lack of evidence and despite the answer given by my esteemed neighbor, I think there are a number of countries where data shows that the introduction of larger health warnings has not had an actual effect on consumption or on smoking by minors. There are many studies that purport to show that larger health warnings work, but many of those studies are surveys of consumers that ask them what they think they would do. And that is not the same as actual behavior of consumers reported after a change in health warnings. I am not familiar personally with the study that Ms. Bertoletti Kemp quoted on Uruguay and Argentina, but I can tell you that the data from Canada, where they increased health warnings from 25% to 50% a few years ago, does not demonstrate a significant change in the long-term decline of smoking incidents. To the rapporteur's question around whether I am aware of a recent WHO study, I think the answer I can be, uh, give is brief. I am not aware, but I'd be happy to receive a copy. And if you are willing to discuss in a way that is transparent, we'd be very eager to have a discussion with you around that. I don't have figures around the total amount of industry spent on advertising in the EU. I represent an association that has three members. It, I do not represent other companies. And even between those three member companies, the data would be sensitive and I would not have any access to it. Ms. Anderson asked about illicit trade <laughs> and what the industry does to shut down copycat operations. I can reassure you where it is in our ability to do so. We do everything we can. Our trademarks, part of the discussion today, are very important to us. 
and we work with law enforcement agencies in many countries to try to prevent our trademarks from being copycatted from counterfeit. Now, there are other elements of illicit trade as well, but this is the part that we can actively pursue ourselves because we own the trademarks. So we have, as companies, dedicated teams looking after trademark violations and working through the legal system to prevent copying of our packs. With regard to smuggling, we have, as was pointed out, cooperation agreements. And if I may just elaborate one point. When we are talking about Article 14 of the proposal, which implements a tracking and tracing system, this will only apply to those products manufactured in the European Union. It will apply to the products that we manufacture in the highest tax countries like Ireland and the UK. Those countries are not origins of products flowing from one to the other. The tracking and tracing system will not apply to those countries outside the European Union that are unfortunately a source of illicit trade. The AIT protocol that was adopted in November last year, as I mentioned, will apply to those countries that ratify it. So I hope that in turn has answered Ms. Sommer's question partially. If I can just add that packaging indeed is not a reason why people smoke. It is, it is as Mr. Fjellner said, it is an image thing. And we believe strongly that we do, should do everything we can to prevent children from smoking. To answer Mr. Schlitter's question, I think we have to be mindful that we do not try to address studies that say larger health warnings do this with studies that will say going from text only to graphic, for example. If the regulator, if the European Parliament and the European Council would decide to implement mandatory pictorial health warnings in the European Union, that is a different debate than taking a lot more of the size of our packs. It's currently 30 percent, 40 percent, and smokers, consumers in the EU are very well aware of the health risks associated with smoking. Increasing the size just makes the letters larger. It does not do anything. Indeed, the Commission has not demonstrated that there is an awareness gap with regard to the health risks associated with smoking. The question by Ms. Harms around how many people the industry, the three companies I represent today, employs in Brussels lobbying can best be answered by looking on the European Transparency Initiative on the Code of Conduct for Lobbyists website. I do not know the answer, but I can assure you it can be found there quite easily. With regard to the remark by the Commissioner, he is, he is absolutely right to point out that the previous directive was upheld by the Court of Justice. However, we believe strongly that in that court decision there are very important elements to consider that I have mentioned today that reinforce our view that the current directive does not have a proper legal basis. It does not harmonize the internal market. It does not have a, as a genuine objective the harmonization of the internal market. And indeed, it creates more obstacles to trade than it reduces. The Commissioner asked whether I had evidence that larger health warnings or graphic health warnings would increase illicit trade. I didn't bring any today because the illicit trade that I'm worried about is mostly going to be created by prohibitions on products that are currently smoked by large amounts of consumers in the Union. <laughs> prohibitions on menthol products, prohibitions on thin cigarettes. As I mentioned, some consumers of those products, when their products are no longer available, will turn to other cigarettes. But some of them may well turn to the illicit market. Do I have proof for that? No, because no country in the world 
has banned menthol and thin cigarettes as the EU is now proposing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I have a, a follow-up question from Karl-Heinz Florenz. Yes, I just have a question for the representative of the tobacco industry. Well, you're saying that the influence of advertising is not so great or that it's been shown that it's a very small uh, impact. So, well, why does it exist at all? And we've also got about uh, 700,000 of your customers die every year. So, of course, uh, you must be interested in getting new customers as well. Uh, don't you think that uh, advertising is a major factor in doing that? Thank you. So, Mr. Rehring, a few words on advertising? Apologies. I would be happy to, uh, to address the, uh, the question by Mr. Florence. Um, it is packaging that does not play a role in getting people to start smoking. The same can be said about advertising, but most advertising is banned in the European Union, and indeed it was in this Parliament about 10 years ago that we were discussing the Tobacco Advertising Ban Directive. Packaging informs consumers of the product that they have available to choose from. And we use packaging and we use advertising where it is permitted to inform consumers of the availability of our products. I told you we do not want children to smoke. We don't want children to smoke. But we do want to market our products to those informed adult consumers who choose to smoke. And packaging and advertising are designed to do that. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end. Oh. Ganz kurz, aber bitte. A very brief comment, please. I'll be very brief. I, I um, as the U.S. calls uh, of justice has been quoted um, quite a few times by, by the person next to me, I'd like to recall um, <coughs> Judge, Judge Kessler uh, from 2006 who ruled that tobacco companies violated federal racketing ring laws by engaging uh, in a decades-long scheme to deceive the public about the dangers of smoking, but in particular with regards to, um, to their relation and their involvement with denying that marketing actually affects young people, um, you know, some defendants, I'm just quoting her, continues to deny that their market to youth in publications with significant youth readership and with imagery that targets youth. So I, I would invite everyone to just look at this ruling uh, if we're interested in having U.S. debates uh, on this. Okay, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the second panel. The Irish Minister would also like to say a few uh, words. I'd like to thank you in advance for uh, your participation to here today. And, uh, so here are your final uh, remarks. Thank you very much for being here today again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just make a few comments in relation, first of all, to thank Ms. Berletti for her excellent presentation and for her comments, uh, and to thank Mr. Herring for being here. Um, I have to say I can't agree with much of what you said. I find this lacks credibility to say that providing more information will not alter behaviour. And I would have to ask you, obviously, the rhetorical question, why, if it won't change behaviour, are you so scared of it? Uh, this is a health issue, first and last. You talk about unjustified interference. And I'd ask you, are we not justified in saving lives? Are we not justified in reducing ill health? Are we not justified in reducing human suffering? Are we not justified in protecting our citizens and shielding our children? I believe we are. And in fact, I believe more than being justified, we're duty bound to do it. But you did say that you had other measures that you might like to share with us that would help. And I'd be very happy to hear at another time what those measures might be in conjunction and in addition to what we plan here. It is very worrying to hear what Linda McCavan has said to say, 
uh, in relation to the increasing rate of boys smoking. Again, I'd like to ask you, are you telling the Parliament you know nothing of this and your industry has nothing to do with it? Uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank Martina Anderson for her support in relation to the directive. And as she says, a product that kills people when it's used precisely as is intended by the manufacturer. Um, in relation to action on the more addictive elements and harmful elements, I think that's already covered in the directive, Mr. Fenner. And Mr. Slater, I'd like, who's not here now, but I mean, he made very important points. And just to, to, to support um, Madam Bartoletti, in relation to, you mentioned the Canada. Well, since the introduction in Canada, it has been found that four times more smokers have expressed the wish to quit. And that's the starting point. So maybe they haven't quit yet, but hopefully they will. You talked about transparency several times, and yet when you're asked by Rebecca Harms about lobbying budgets and numbers, you fail to tell us anything. Yet we know that you have 97 full-time lobbyists on the tobacco industry here at this parliament alone, and God knows how much money you spend on supporting them and other initiatives around this. I would suggest to you that a sensible industry, knowing what it knows now about the product that it produces, would diversify into other areas which do not have such catastrophic consequence for the people who use your product. Awareness does help, and I know that as a doctor. Because when I practiced, anybody who came to, came to my surgery who was a diabetic at type 1 or type 2 diabetes, I would ask them to leave a note in their cigarette box if they were smokers that they should look at each time they lit up a cigarette. And it was a simple formula. Smoking plus diabetes equals amputation. That's the disastrous consequence of tobacco smoking for people who have diabetes. And we know that even those without diabetes will get peripheral vascular disease and lose limbs. <clears throat> I'm going to finish now. I was asked in the Irish Parliament after I made a statement, I have received a letter from the industry asking me not to refer to it as an evil industry again. But I would ask you, what would you call an industry that produces a product that is deliberately addictive, ensnares young people, and ultimately kills one in two of those who use it? And as others have pointed out, some quit, but many more die, 700,000 Europeans a year to be precise. And you seek to replace them. Their lives are the lifeblood of your industry. That's the long and the short of it. So yeah, I am emotive and passionate because this is a life and death issue for 700,000 of our citizens in Europe. And so I'm going to appeal again to the MPs here today, the MEPs, to use your power for good for the good of the health of our people. Thank you very much. Minister, I'm sure you can see that you have our support. We'll do everything in our power to support you. I hope that you will be able to use your power, I hope you'll be able to use your power in the Council to uh, ensure that this legislative uh, file is brought to a successful conclusion. We'd like to thank you once again for having attended this afternoon. And I'll now turn to uh, Dr. Martina Puchka langer She's the head of the unit of cancer prevention in the German Cancer Research Center. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chairman. Could I have, please, my first slide? questioning the, the technique that I have my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, first of all, good afternoon, distinguished participants. I'm representing the German Cancer Research Center that has an opinion on this draft, this proposal of the Commission on the Tobacco Product Regulation, and I want to say you all Please go so far as you can go, and please act now. We published 
some papers in peer-reviewed journals and also in an own series of the Cancer Center on additives. And I think this was the reason why I am invited now. Um, I want to start with um, the international consensus on the ban or regulation of all tobacco additives that was made uh, by the partial guidelines of the implementation of Article 9 and 10 of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And I want to remind you that it was Europe, the European Union, that was very active in developing these guidelines. Um, and why uh, we, uh, the, the Union was so active in this? And we we'll switch to the next slide. What is not possible? No. Okay. Why should additives be banned in tobacco products? The reason is evidence-based, is science-based, and it's also based on the quotes of the tobacco industry. And I bring, you, bring with me here a quote of British American Tobacco telling the UK government in 1999, I will say, uh, quote this, ingredients are indeed used to make cigarettes more palatable and to reduce harshness and irritation. And that's it, why the industry is using the additives. So, and we know in the meantime, through a lot of articles and research, that tobacco additives can increase the palatability, the smoothness, and the attractiveness of products, and thus is indirect, indirect responsible for an increased consumption rate. That means also an increased health risk and increased morbidity and mortality. And I bring with me, with me only three, three slides on, on, the, on the science base. First slide is on sugar. Looking on sugar and uh, sugar similar products like uh, glucose, fructose, other ones, and honey, we will see that, in, that in these additives improve the taste, decreases the harshness, and increases the palatability. And through the combustion rate, it forms carcinogens. This is scientific proved. Next is, so we first, one, one, one slide back to the sugar. I, would, I must say why we allow to sweeten the poison of tobacco. Next slide, mental. We have many good research telling us that it's masking the harshness. And you, I can give you the data for this. This is no problem. We know that mental is cooling, is pain relieving, and numbing, so it has a little anesthetic effect. We use it as a pharmaceutical product. You all maybe use it when you have cough. And you know that with mental you can increase your inhalation, you can inhale much more deeper. So we have the effects of menthol, we know it. And regarding menthol cigarettes, we know that menthols, uh, menthol cigarettes are in a, in a small market in Europe so far. However, the tobacco industry intends to grow this market we know this from their own documents and from their uh, speeches on their um, um, own um, um, meetings. Uh, so the, we have to, uh, to, to fear this growing market in, 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 in mental, but also mental is used not only in mentholated secrets. Nearly every brand has a little bit mentol together with other, um, with other um, additives. Next point is liquoric. We have the evidence that increases the palatability, so that it increases really the palatability of the poison tobacco. It improves the flavor. It improves all, uh, all the, the taste. And it's enough evidence there. And we have a lot of, uh, of clear uh, signs uh, showing the carcinogenic effect 
when it's burned, when it when it, the pyrolyzes, when it when the uh, when the the tobacco is um, is inhaled. So, on the other side, we have also additives without flavor, um, like binders, humectants, and coloring agency, agents. They are forming through the combustion or pyrolysis carcinogenic substances too. And we have also the, the evidence for this. So, it's in, but these, uh, these non-flavored uh, um, additives, they, um, they increase the attractivity, of course, of the products. Then next, I'm coming to um, a market that is now focused as, uh, by, the, by the Commission's uh, proposal to, to, to ban the market for characterizing flavors. Of course, this market should be banned. Of course, we cannot allow that uh, substance like vanilla, menthol, mango, chocolate, or other fruit exotics and so on are in, in, in secrets and increasing the attractivity. Uh, but Currently, it's really a uh, small market. So, so that it's danger, of course, for the in uh, increasing the irritation, uh, the initiation of, uh, of young people by these products. But the big market is another one, and I want to, uh, to, to, to focus more on this big market that must be also regulated. Uh, then you must not forget uh, who is uh, the uh, the leading who are the, the leading brands, and all these substances uh, and all um, sorry uh, this mix of additives they um, allow uh, the tobacco industry to um, to add them to make them much, to make the, the products much more palatable and to reduce the harshness and irritation. They say it again and again. So it's a clear facilitation of initiation and maintenance of smoking. And another effect is with these many additives coming together, it's an interaction and it's a synergistic effect of additives. So especially the mixture of small amounts of several additives can have similar effects as bigger amounts of a single of one single additive. So, and many additives produce carcinogen substances on pyrolysis. There is, and that for them it's no harmless threshold levels for additives. So please bring in, in consideration uh, these many mixtures of really dangerous substances when they are burned. My next slide is coming up to a new technology that was made for attraction, for, to attract more consumers for the poison of tobacco. And these are these capsules uh, with filter systems which enhance the, pro, uh, the, the attractivity of the products. So finally, what uh, is now, what should be done? What are our recommendations? We are voting for a ban of all additives that may enhance the palatability, smoothness, and attractiveness of tobacco products. Why? To protect the youth from initiation, but also to support smokers to quit smoking. What should, we, should be done again? Ban of all additives that are carcinogenic in unburned and in burned form. Why? To protect the consumers and to reduce morbidity and mortality. And finally, what should not be done is set a maximum levels for any additives. Why? We have no reliable methods to define a threshold level for distinguished, distinctive taste. And there are many interactions between additives with synergistic effects on palatability, smoothness, and inhalation. Finally, my summary is, a ban is needed on additives that enhance palatability, smoothness and attractiveness of tobacco products. A ban is needed on additives that are carcinogenic in unburned or burned form, and manufacturers and importers must prove that any additive they want to use 
is really harmless. And with pleasure, the German Cancer Research Center will provide the data, the facts, the science to you, and also a list, a proposed list for banning which kind of additives and also which in, of those additives that should be excluded from the ban. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Pushke Langer. The next speaker will be Luke Eusens, Advocate Offer for the Association of European Cancer Organizations. You have 10 minutes. Mr. Chair, um, Members of Parliament, I will address the issue of illicit trade. I have been investigating illicit trade for since 1992 and have published in peer-reviewed articles. The reason why I mention this is that the tobacco industry make claims which are not being reviewed in scientific journals. 20 years ago, the industry was saying that this problem of smuggling was a very easy one. It was linked to the level of taxation. If taxation was high, smuggling was high. If taxation was low, smuggling was low. The reality 20 years ago was different in the sense that Denmark had high taxes and low smuggling, and Spain had the lowest level of taxation and huge smuggling, and Italy had low taxes and huge smuggling. For what reason? The reason was that the industry, American tobacco companies, were organizing the smuggling. This was not only my opinion, but it was also the opinion of this parliament in 97 during the transit committee, and it was also the opinion of the European community who sued the tobacco companies. As a result, in 2004, Philip Morris settled and paid $1,250,000,000. dollars. GTI paid in 2007 $400 million, and three tobacco companies in Canada paid $1,700,000,000 Canadian dollars. One could say, well, this is the past, but this is the past, but they are not doing it again. Well, we have a complaint against GTI uh, launched in November 2011. What is in fact the cause of illicit trade? It's more complex. It's a question of demand and supply. And the demand is mostly driven by price and the supply is by legal and illegal tobacco companies looking for more profits, increasing market shares, facilitated by corruption, the presence of criminal networks and weak government enforcement capacity. Generally speaking, the price plays a role, but other factors are more important, and we see often that the supply side is much more important than the demand side. We have done a study in 18 European um, countries, which was published in the scientific journal Tobacco Control online in December and in press next year, and we looked at illicit rate in 18 countries, and the data show that illicit rate is not directly related to tobacco prices, but is more frequent in countries with a land or sea border with Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, and Belarus. We notice, for instance, that the country with the lowest prices are this time Latvia and Lithuania, and have the huge the illicit problem. Coming back now to the claims of industry, the industry has launched a campaign saying that plain packaging would lead to increased illicit trade. This is from a website of Philip Morris, and it says various experts have expressed concerns that plain packaging will increase illicit trade by making cigarettes easier and cheaper to copy. So it says easier and cheaper to copy, and you will see there a white pack. In a campaign from GTI in the, in the UK, they will use also white packs to present plain packs. The reality is that plain packs are not white, 
and will contain pictorial health warnings and security features. So what they are doing is mispresenting the case. They have been saying now, well, of course, these pixel health warnings, they may have pictorial health warnings, but it's the brand features which makes it more difficult to copy. Again, this is nonsense, and the nonsense is using the, what the tobacco industry is saying themselves. Every product is easy to copy. Every design is easy to copy. And this comes from Philip Morris, not in a campaign against plain packaging, but in order to promote, to promote their tracking and tracing system, Codentify, where it says, evidence shows that counterfeits can make copies of even the most sophisticated paper stamps in three weeks. That's the reality. Everything which is visible is easy to copy. The other thing is, well, it will make products cheaper to copy. Again, this is not true. The production cost, the manufacturing cost of a pack of cigarettes, of count feedback, is between 10 to 12 cents. If we can imagine that the packaging cost one third of it, it will cost the packaging between three and six cents. Even if you do some saving on that, you will save one cent, two cents, on the price which could cost between four euros and 10 euros. Again, I'm quoting Philip Morris documents which agree that the, the manufacturing cost is very low. And what about the impact assessment? Well, the impact assessment came to the same conclusion on page 93. The industry has argued that plain packaging will increase illicit rate. However, no convincing evidence has been submitted. That's the reality, they never provide evidence which has been reviewed in peer-reviewed articles. What has been the opinion of impact assessment in the UK? Well, in the UK on page 20, this says, standardized packs would still need to carry colored picture warnings, so it will not be white packs, as well as covert markings. And counterfeiters are already able to produce sophisticated replicated goods. So that's the reality, everything is counterfeitable and they should stop to make this nonsense about plain packaging uh, increasing illicit rate. But of course they will say that also about the ban on display, they are saying that the display ban will increase illicit rates. In Canada, display bans have been introduced in the provinces at different dates, but most of them have introduced them in 2008. Since 2008, there has been a, a thematic drop of illicit rate, and in 2010, there has been a, display, there has been a ban on flavored tobacco products in force since July 2010. Since then, there has been a dramatic drop of illicit rate, which again is an indication that illicit rate is a little bit more complicated than the industry pretends. Now coming back on the illicit rate protocol which has been adopted on the 12th of no November in South Korea. To be clear, this has been adopted, it's still not in force, it has to be ratified by 40 countries. So far, 13 countries have signed it, but you need to have 40 ratifications. The illicit protocol is an international convention and makes an obligation of unique, secure, and non-removable identification markings on all packaging, packs, cartons, and master cases. I want to remind you that in the Commission proposal, it's only an obligation for unique identifiers on packs, but not on cartons and master cases, and there should be also an obligation for the outside packaging. One of the essential obligations in this illicit protocol is the role of industry. And you have Article 8 of the protocol, 8.12. Obligations assigned to a party shall not be performed by or delegated to the tobacco industry. And the system shall be controlled by the parties. Our comments in relation to EU traceability proposals is considering the long history of industry complicity and the fact that still one major company is being accused of organized smuggling, the, comp the tobacco industry 
should not choose the data storage company and the auditor for the traceability data. The choice of the data storage company should be a decision by the member states and the choice of the auditor a decision by the EU, by the EU Commission. The data storage should be hosted at member states and EU level and not per company as been defined in the actual EU proposals. And one important uh, comment also, if you want to have traceability, you should have a link between the unique, unique identifiers on packs and the outside packaging. Otherwise, if your pallet goes through the supply chain, you have to open the pallet, you have to open the master cases, you have to open the cartons, you have to open the packs to put the recording of new events. It's impossible to have a tracking and tracing system between aggregation. On conclusion, there is no evidence for the industry claims that plain packaging will increase uh, illicit trade. Plain packaging will always have large pictorial health warnings and a security feature. Every pack is easy to counterfeit. And the choice of the data storage company of traceability should be a decision <coughs> by the member states and the choice of the other to a decision by the EU members. Obligations on the traceability should not be delegated or performed by the tobacco industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Mr. Josens. The next speaker is David, Dr. David Hammond, Associated Professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo, Canada. Please, Mr. Hammond, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. I've been asked to discuss the evidence as it relates to packaging and labeling policies in the proposed directive. And just by way of disclosure, we've had some discussion about the names David and Goliath. My name is David, but I assure you it's a coincidence. Um, also in terms of disclosure, I have served as an expert witness in several court cases, including those that involve packaging and labeling in Australia and elsewhere. And I have advised a number of governments and regulatory bodies, including the European Commission on Packaging and Labeling. Now, advertising and marketing has played a fundamental role in the rise and fall of global tobacco use and in shaping attitudes towards smoking. Most recently, tobacco promotion has had to evolve in response to disappearing marketing channels due to increased regulation. In the absence of traditional advertising, packaging has become more important. And for packaging to succeed, it must reach potential smokers as early as possible and not simply communicate the qualities of the cigarette itself but to assume the role of lifestyle advertising. Now, in brief, packaging matters because of its tremendous reach. There are somewhere around 100 million smokers in Europe. The average smoker will see their pack many thousands of times per year. And more importantly, packs have very high levels of visibility, including among non-smokers and young people in places of retail and in other areas. Now, I'm going to discuss evidence in three areas of packaging, beginning with what I call standardized, what many people refer to as plain packaging. And this is what plain packaging looks like in practice. Brand logos and imageries are prohibited. The color is standardized. And all government mandated information, including health warnings, remain on packs. It does not prohibit different varieties or names. If there were 15 varieties of Marlboro prior to implementation, there can be 15 varieties of Marlboro following. <coughs> Now, Australia was the first country in the world to implement plain packaging in December of 2012. New Zealand recently announced it would follow. Tobacco companies have launched three separate legal challenges in Australia, one of which has concluded, in which the High Court of Australia upheld the plain packaging law. One of the factors addressed in these court cases is evidence, the likelihood of public health benefit. Now, plain packaging has only been in place for a couple of months in Australia. It's too early to assess the impact. But there is a vast evidence base on the influence of pack design, including experimental studies of plain packaging. This includes many published studies, government-commissioned research in Australia. And in fact, some of the best evidence comes from the industry itself. And here I'm talking about confidential documents that tobacco companies have been required to release through court cases. They include extensive consumer research and information on marketing strategy. Overall, there's unequivocal evidence that packaging can influence consumer behavior. 
There's very good case studies, examples like this one, the Benson and Hedges Silver Slide Pack. When it was introduced into the UK market, it had a very important increase in market share despite few other forms of promotion. Plain packaging can also help reduce the false beliefs about the relative risks of different brands. In other words, the belief that some varieties are perceived to be less harmful than others. And here I'm talking about brands that used to be referred to as light or mild. Perhaps most importantly, there's unequivocal evidence that plain packaging reduces brand appeal, particularly among youth and young people. There are, for example, experimental studies that have found that youth are less likely to accept an offer of cigarettes if the cigarettes are offered in a plain package rather than a branded package. Now, given the nature and strength of nicotine addiction, I think it remains to be seen if plain packaging will reduce smoking among adult smokers. It's possible, perhaps even probable, but I would say the impact is likely to be modest. In contrast, there's a very high likelihood that plain packaging would reduce smoking initiation among young people in the long term. Now, it's very difficult to try and assess the magnitude of reduction, but it's because of the reach of plain packaging, which essentially would be universal among legal products, that even a small impact at the population level can accrue into meaningful benefit. If there are 100 million smokers in the EU, and if plain packaging were to succeed in changing behavior in only 1%, 1 in 100, that translates into 1 million fewer smokers in Europe. Now, as part of the plain packaging regulations, Australia has also restricted the size of packs, such that packs of slim cigarettes are now illegal. This serves as a precedent for the ban on slims proposed in the European Directive. Some of you may know that slims and super slims are among the fastest growing segment in the tobacco market. I recently reviewed internal tobacco industry research and marketing on pack shape, pack size, and different types of openings. Tobacco industry research clearly and consistently demonstrates that slim cigarettes are associated with false health beliefs, including the belief that they're lower tar when that's not the case, and that slims reinforce the belief that smoking is an effective way to lose weight or stay slim. And I'd like to emphasize this point. There was a report that was released in the past two weeks from the U.S. National Bureau of Economic Research, which found that 46% of girls and 30% of boys are smoking in part to control their weight. Slim cigarettes reinforce this belief. And as others have pointed out, 80 to 90% of smoking initiation begins in childhood or youth. Industry documents also show that slim cigarettes are marketed predominantly to young women. This is a document from Philip Morris, which identifies teenage girls between the age of 15 and 17 as being the target. <clears throat> One of the other consequences of different pack shapes, especially the narrow super slim packs, is that they have the potential to distort health warnings. Here are two examples of tobacco packages in Canada, and you can see that the text on the left is rendered so small that it's almost illeg illegible, and the image required by the government is also distorted. And there's consumer perception research that shows that the same warning on a slim pack is deemed to be less impactful than a traditionally sized pack. Now, the last area I'd like to talk about is health warnings. I think it's fair to say that, like the industry, the government is learning to use the package to communicate with the public. And the evidence base in this area is very large and growing. There are well over 100 published studies in scientific journals. These studies include everything from eye tracking, fMRI brain scan studies, to very large cohort studies with many thousands of participants. Now, the Keckham presentation earlier referred to a U.S. court case suggesting that large picture warnings have not passed legal scrutiny. The presentation failed to note that there's a separate U.S. Court of Appeals judgment which has upheld the warnings. I'm very familiar with this case and I'd be happy to answer any questions. The fact is, is that more than 50 countries have successfully implemented large picture warnings. Tobacco companies have issued legal challenges in many of these ju jurisdictions. And I am not aware of a single case in which a, course ha a court has permanently struck down health warnings. So to suggest that there's no reliable evidence is to regard both the scientific evidence base and the judgment of courts throughout the world. So what does this evidence say? Large picture warnings do lead many smokers to consider quitting and prompt many to make a quit attempt. Having said that, I would say the primary functions of warnings is not to make adult smokers quit, even if this occurs. 
Rather, the primary function is to reach children and youth before the age when smoking initiation occurs. And there is evidence to show that 60% of non-smokers in the UK can recall a specific message from PACS. And four in 10 never smokers in the UK say that the health warnings have persuaded them not to start smoking. That number is closer to nine in 10 in Canada. Where does, uh, and I would add, and I want to be very clear about this, there is published scientific evidence that large picture warnings have reduced smoking prevalence. I am from Canada, I am intimately familiar with the data, and I can tell you that we have had a dramatic decline in smoking following the implementation of picture warnings. The year following the introduction of the warnings, we had our largest decline in smoking on record in the past 60 years. This is not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of fact. Where do EU countries currently stand with respect to international standards? As I mentioned, more than 50 countries have implemented warnings. Countries like Cayman Islands, Mauritius, the Cook Islands have implemented pictorial warnings. Many EU member states have not. This slide gives you a sense of the size of warnings in other countries and the standards that have been established in other jurisdictions. And whereas pictures currently appear on only one side of European PACs, most other countries include pictures on both sides in part because it increases the visibility of these warnings at the point of sale. Health warnings do wear out. We've been tracking them in Canada, like any advertising campaign. The EU warnings uh, are approximately 10 years old, and some jurisdictions have been very good at refreshing the message content, and we know that that's an important factor in their effectiveness. The only other thing I'll say about content is as warnings get bigger and more shocking, they need to remain credible, and using real people is a very effective way of communicating that to smokers. And in addition to shocking information, it is important to provide supportive information for smokers trying to quit. Now, I'd like to finish by saying that for all I've said today, I think the effects of these packaging policies are fairly straightforward. The pack on the left is what you would expect a consumer product to look like that kills almost 2,000 people in Europe each day. The package clearly discourages use. In contrast, the pack on the right, the current standard in the European Union, still serves as an inducement to smoke and does more to promote rather than discourage use. Ultimately, I think this is what both common sense and the scientific evidence indicates. Thank you very much. Sir. Our next speaker is Dr. Jean King. Of tobacco control. Please, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you for giving me the chance to talk about um, interference by the tobacco industry in tobacco control policies and what we should be doing about it. Very briefly, Cancer Research UK is a research organisation with the largest non government funded research body. Um, and we research into the causes, treatment and prevention of cancer. Uh, we have to work on tobacco because over a quarter of all cancer deaths are caused by tobacco. We can't ignore it. But as a research organisation, we also make sure that everything we say on this issue is very strongly evidence-based, um, unlike um, comments that have been made about a lack of evidence on, on what we're talking about today. Um, I'd like to talk about why we need to oppose the tobacco industry, what the industry did to try and prevent the original tobacco product directive, and, and what Article 5, what we can learn from that, and what Article 5.3 says, and how we, we need to move forward to meet our obligations under the FCTC. So, um, first of all, why should we oppose the tobacco industry? Um, we've heard about the, the toll on lives in the EU. Um, also, though, we haven't heard so much about how the tobacco industry has sought to block, amend, or delay key legislation in the EU aimed at protecting the health of citizens. And there's a very large body of evidence which shows that the tobacco industry has distorted science, it's tried to suppress research or produce biased research, it's paid scientists to present biased research. Um, it's also used front groups to make its case and it's not always clear that these groups are representing the tobacco industry. It's lied to de for decades about the harm that its products cause. It's facilitated smuggling as we've heard, used additives to increase the addictiveness and attractiveness of tobacco to children and it's targeted marketing at children, women and the poor. And there are just some references of reviews that in themselves look at hundreds and hundreds of references and we'd be happy to provide more um, evidence if that's required. 
Um, so we're not dealing with a normal consumer product. We've heard that it kills one in two long-term users. Um, if it came to the market today, it would not be allowed. And we're not dealing with a normal industry. As the research evidence shows, the tobacco industry has sought to obfuscate, deny the harm its product causes, and delay or block measures to protect citizens, especially children. Because please remember, this is not an adult choice. This is an addiction started in childhood. And we know that in the UK alone, 157,000 11 to 15-year-olds start smoking every year. So imagine how many children start smoking across the EU. And we want to stop that. So um, let's look at how the tobacco industry sought to stop us getting the Tobacco Product Directive in the first place. Um, as, as many people will be aware, there's, due to litigation in the US, there's millions of pages of internal tobacco industry documents on the internet, and these have been the subject of academic research. And the University of Bath looked um, in particular at this, and it's a, a long report that's available on the Smoke Free Partnership um, website and has been published in peer-reviewed journals. And basically, three principal arguments were used against the directive, that it was outside the scope of the EU's powers, that it contravened existing trade agreements, and would have adverse economic impacts. So if these arguments sound familiar, it's because they're the same ones being used again. Um, and the tobacco industry often uses arguments that it's been advised are groundless, because it can, it can afford to delay things, to introduce costly um, legal proceedings, and so on. But these arguments didn't prevent us getting a, a real gold standard piece of legislation um, in the form of the Tobacco Product Directive. So moving on to Article 5.3 of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which aims to protect citizens from tobacco through a series of measures, it's clear to the World Health Organization and to the 176 countries that have now ratified it that the tobacco industry cannot be dealt with like a normal stakeholder. So the, the Framework Convention Article 5.3 says there's a fundamental and irreconcilable conflict between the tobacco industry's interests and public health policy interests. And it goes on to say that the broad array of tactics that the industry has used to interfere with setting and implementing tobacco control measures is well documented. Therefore, governments should establish measures to limit interactions to the tobacco industry and ensure the transparency of those interactions that do occur. And um, the guidelines go on to talk about that parties should interact with the tobacco industry only when and to the extent strictly necessary to enable them to effectively regulate the tobacco industry and tobacco products. So that's very clear, very clear guidelines. And where interactions with the tobacco industry are necessary, parties should ensure that they're transparent. Wherever possible, they should be conducted in public um, and records made available. And parties should formulate and implement a code of conduct for officials prescribing the standards with which they should comply in their dealings with the tobacco industry. So it behoves the EU institutions to live up to this best practice and these highest international standards as the rest of the world looks to the EU. And so what are these best practices and international standards? Um, we know that the current, there are current measures that the, the um, Parliament and the Commission have introduced, but these are inadequate to meet the obligations and standards established by Article 5.3, um, and they were introduced before the FCTC. What we need is a code of conduct specifically in relation to the tobacco industry. Um, we need to make sure that there are rules for commissioners and officials that are very clear that we shouldn't be working with PR firms and legal firms and other bodies that have tobacco industry interests and that all contractors should declare any such interests. And tobacco industry representatives should not be on advisory groups or policy committees and so on. Um, furthermore, we need to ensure that there's the registration and disclosure of lobbyists. It should be mandatory for all lobbyists. Um, we should make sure that all meetings between officials and MEPs and tobacco industry interest groups are published on the internet. And of course, some MEPs are already doing this, and the Greens, um, we noted, have established a register for this purpose. MEPs should make sure that in the member states that we're also meeting our obligations under Article 5.3. So, for example, the UK Department of Health lists all its meetings with tobacco industry groups. 
and wherever possible, minutes of meetings should be published at both member state and EU level to ensure transparency. So we believe that the tobacco industry can make its submissions in writing to officials. They should be able to express themselves. We think that face-to-face -face meetings should comply with the FCTC. In other words, they should only take place when strictly necessary to enable them to effectively regulate the tobacco industry and tobacco products. If EU institutions adopt clear guidelines that meet our FCTC obligations, it would be sending a message to the world that the EU places the health of its citizens above the financial interests of an industry that has no respect for health whatsoever. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you. We'll now move on to debate with colleagues. Our first speaker is Ms. Panova. Thank you, President. Uh, I will speak in Bulgarian, so please, everybody, could you put your headphones? Uh, пакет от мерки, които индустрията ни убеждава, че няма да проработят и изглежда така, сякаш индустрията има по-добри предложения как да бъдат ограничени, ограничени съответно въздействието. No? No? Okay. Fehlt uns. Сега. We're missing the interpretation. Have we got it ready? Нищ за фъфюгън хам. Инсофен бил ще сама цу клиен ин кабин. Дамет ди колеги на Hello, I think we have interpretation back. Shall I repeat from the beginning? Okay, I'll start. Yeah. Okay, no? okay. Yeah. Do you start from the beginning again, please? Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank our various expert speakers for outlining their positions. It uh, would appear that we could take measures as regards packs and packaging, but that might not be the most effective approach. Industry, of course, has a different idea on matters. This is a very serious issue, of course, European citizens are suffering and indeed citizens elsewhere around the world. I know that uh, the uh, macho guy that uh, advertised for Marlboro, he smoked heavily and died as a result uh, of heavy smoking. Philip Morris noted that there was a case and Someone died as a result of smoking, uh, had to receive compensation. Perhaps in times of crisis, people smoke and savings are made on health costs. But let me give you an example. Perhaps there are different ways to address this. We can look at illegal trade and how these costs are to be borne or the health insurance costs and how these are to be borne. What about warnings? Each cigarette should contain a warning. What about other measures? Lobbyists uh, have to be paid by industry. What about the people that lose their jobs? They need to obtain qualifications and other jobs, we would need to take action to that end. And what about the manufacturing costs of tobacco products? They have to be paid by industry. 
if the producer were to decide on other products. Peter Lisa, I would like to support the proposal. I would ask for a fair approach. I think we need to be uniform in our approach. I have a couple of questions to our experts. Firstly, on passive smoking. Industry has raised doubts on statistics as regards passive smoking. Is it really the root cause of deaths, as the WHO has stated? I have been involved in a study as a doctor on sudden deaths amongst children. This can be linked to passive smoking. But what about the other adverse health effects? I would repeat my suggestion that we lay greater emphasis on passive smoking. 90% of warnings refer to the health of the smoker. We need to focus on the health of children, the nasty side effects for children and other people who do not smoke themselves. I think there are good examples that we could follow from other countries, and I would suggest that we take up such examples. And one question again on e-cigarettes. A uh, previous speaker mentioned these. Nobody is claiming that e-cigarettes are good for health. But I have received written comments from many people who said that this was the way they wean themselves off smoking. It is less harmful for your general environment. Very little passive smoking with e-cigarettes. When it comes to heroin, the EU has a harm reduction policy. Uh, heroin is distributed by the state as are needles. Why not adopt a similar harm reduction strategy with e-cigarettes? Thank you. The issue on e-cigarettes, I have had a similar comment. But I have a couple of other questions. The first speaker, I don't have the name, Mrs. Puchka Langa talked about how poisonous tobacco was and talked about all the other toxins mixed in with tobacco. And I would also ask this question to our speaker from tobacco. Why do we have tobacco trade then? Why has Canada not banned all tobacco products? That would be the logical conclusion of everything that we've heard. Tobacco is not acceptable. It shouldn't be marketed. It shouldn't be sold. It's so poisonous it should not be sold. But it is available on the market. Even those countries that have adopted the most stringent measures, the most striking warnings, uh, in those countries, for whatever reason, they still have tobacco products on the market. Can you explain that for me? Perhaps this is a fundamental question that needs to be addressed. I also have a question for the second speaker, I believe, he said that packaging does influence consumer behavior and there are sufficient studies to bear this out. Could we have a list of which studies you're referring to? I hear a lot of information about studies, left, right and center, surveys, uh, research, who said what. You can tell me what you like. I'd like to know precisely where what has been written down, and I'd like to have references for those study reports. Otherwise, we're not in a position to take a proper decision. Now, I, just a moment. I think that we can't have... Uh, we need to be transparent. I don't think it's acceptable that this information is provided this way. Mrs. Summer... I said that we would not be dealing with such an approach. I pointed that out to Mr. Lisa, and that will be what we'll be doing here. Our next speaker is Mr. Humosakos. Humosakos, you have the floor for one minute. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. 
Two comments, Chairman. Thanks very much. And they come from the report that's being discussed. The general basis for the report is that it improves the efficiency of the internal market and, of course, protects public health. All the reforms and measures in the in the proposal, do you think they actually do improve the internal market or do they cause problems? The goal is supposed to be that the workings of the internal market be improved and there are provisions which aren't, which aren't con consistent with that strategic goal. We're looking for a mixture, as I said before, between public health protection on the one hand and the protection of the smooth running of the internal market on the other. Parliament needs a position, a logical, non-fanatical position on this. Secondly, and finally, Chairman, the proposal says it leaves out of certain provisions the question of flavours, projects, products, sorry, different from cigarettes, uh, cigars, etc. And this is based, this exception, on the fact that this use is carried out by certain categories of consumer and isn't anything to do with young people, basically. That's why we allowed them to have an exception. Could I ask all the colleagues, do we really see young people smoking slim cigarettes? Have you seen them in any of your own countries? And what studies back that theory up? Mrs. Gerling, one and a half minute, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think undoubtedly we all want to see um, smoking reduce. It's clearly um, very bad for your health. As an ex-smoker myself, I can confirm it's not so easy to give it up, but once you do, uh, it's like being unchained from a lunatic. So um, it's uh, certainly something which I fully support. Today's discussions have left me with two really um, perhaps counterintuitive questions. Um, because I don't want to take our, us to take action that may have unintended effects. I want us to take the right action. And I'm still um, really unclear about e-cigarettes, and I wondered if I might take advantage of the speakers in the second part, uh, sorry, the final part of the proposals, just to ask a question about, for example, the Canadian experience on e-cigarettes and whether they actually, um, if they're a useful step, in the health chain of make, helping people to give up, then I don't want us to take action that would cut that out. So I'm really still not clear on that in my own mind. And secondly, with regards to packaging and the effects of counterfeiting, that's all I'm interested in with packaging, is I'm totally sold on the idea of not, not advertising, not making it attractive <coughs> to young people, etc. But if packaging is in any way... Um, necessary, it's necessary to have space on the packaging for measures that will stop smuggling and counterfeiting because I'm particularly concerned about the health aspects of counterfeited cigarettes which I understand can be up to three times as harmful as those which are sold legally. Thank you. Just one brief question, otherwise we won't have time to hear back from our experts. We want to hear their answers. So Chris Davis and Sophie Ukoni and Karl-Heinz Florence. When the Commission first introduced this legislation a decade ago on, on this subject, uh, it made no proposal for picture health warnings. That came from the Parliament, came actually from an amendment by myself, uh, which then got rejected by, got through the committee, rejected by the Parliament. We then had a cross-party support for it coming back in, saying member states may introduce health warnings on cigarette packs. That went through the Parliament. Um, at three o'clock in the morning, on, in the last night of conciliation, uh, the Commission was still opposing the introduction of picture health warnings. But we said uh, to member states, well, we're only saying member states may introduce this legislation. So we did a deal and uh, we overrode the Commission. And the following morning, there was a joint press conference between the three institutions where the, commission, the commission, uh, commissioner of the time said that he welcomed the, the, the move, having spent six months doing his very best to oppose it. However, you know, we like converts. Question is on the evidence. I mean, I, I introduced this, these health warnings. To, I facilitated that, and I'm, I'm, I'm therefore keen that uh, 
uh, they may have an effect, and indeed for the purpose of, of stopping young people starting smoking in the first place. But we have heard from the representatives of the smoking of the industry that um, you know, there is no evidence that they, that they have any effect. On the other hand, you know, we, we also hear that there is evidence. Can anyone clarify the difference? Thank you very much. Chris? Now, uh, now Mrs. Oconi, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much for organizing this very interesting hearing. It's crucial, I think, that the European Union, when it comes to a text such as this, be bold. That the Union be bold, because we're all aware, and it's been said several times this afternoon, 650,000 deaths per year in the EU, 100 million throughout the world. I beg your pardon, 50,000 people in Europe who don't smoke, yet still die from passive smoking. These are figures which make it imperative that we do something, we bear this in mind. And the Union, through a bold text, I think, really would buff up its image. And we should be brave when it comes to this text. I really want us to work on this aspect of the matter, that children not be encouraged to smoke through various methods. I've got four children, two of them smoke. When I'm allowed to go by the Parliament to pick up my children at school, I often see children poisoning themselves because they've, they want to be like their friends. And I think the warnings on cigarette packets aren't enough. I think the crucial thing to stop children giving in to smoking would be to increase the size of the warning. Teaching people and the question of patches as well. I think we should think about that, which is a way for heavy smokers, such as myself, stopping smoking. Thanks very much, Chairman. Well, we need to have uh, as much information as possible in the, on tobacco issues so that we have a, a clear picture of the situation. Well, I have a, a question for the representatives of the industry. You mentioned uh, uh, tobacco s smuggling, uh, but I've read some very serious studies which say that illegal... Uh, cigarettes uh, are made up to more than 50 percent of uh, com products produced by your own companies that come from say uh, St. Petersburg and then uh, cross over the border and go from being legal products to illegal products. So you're legally producing the uh, illegal cigarette. So I would be very sensitive to this issue if I were you. Carl Schluter was a uh, follow-up question. It's for David Hammond. Um, you said you had been advising governments, and one of the worries I have is the um, claim of the tobacco industry that uh, it's a kind of trademark violation using plain packaging. So what are the legal advice you would give us to justify that and, and overcome such problems? Yeah, vielen Dank. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, the representative of the tobacco industry has been addressed directly, so I'll give him the floor briefly, and then we'll continue. That, Mr. Chairman, is the question by Mr. Florence. Um, I can be very brief about it. Smuggling hurts us. We have an agreement, the CAC and member companies have agreements with the European Commission, and under the terms of those agreements, if our product sold originally in Russia, as the example that Mr. Florence used, is seized in the European Union, we pay penalties. We pay the excise duty times five as a penalty. So we have a very clear incentive on top of the commercial incentive to prevent these practices from happening. The commercial incentive is, of course, that any sell, sale of a tobacco product of a cigarette that is smuggled does not go to us in the first place. Okay. Done. 
So we'll uh, go to the original speakers in order. It's, if it's possible. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there, there are several points that I'd like to quickly, very quickly address, and I'm sure my colleagues will want to address them too. Um, uh, Mr. Lisa talked about passive smoking. Um, and, of course, this is the area where the industry really went to town trying to distort the evidence and prevent um, governments wanting to take stronger action. But we do now have smoke-free laws in many countries, and we need to make sure those happen in other countries to protect children. There are discussions as well about um, preventing smoking in cars with children, but that's very much at the debate stage, and it's not really what the Tobacco Product Directive itself is about, but, but be sure that we are looking at that issue and, and think it's a very important one. Um, on e-cigarettes, again, colleagues will have comments to make. Um, we recognise that um, these are, people are saying that they're helpful for them to cut down or try to quit. And we would like to see all non-tobacco prod nicotine products under regulated um, under pharmaceutical and medicines regulation. Um, in the UK, we are looking at harm reduction as an approach. There's two consultations that are going to be responded to shortly, so it will be interesting to see what comes out of them. I think the key concerns we have are to make sure that the people who need them get them, but that they're not marketed to, to either young people and that they don't demotivate people from quitting. But we're aware that e-cigarettes is a big issue, but again, it's one that we don't think should come under the Tobacco Product Directive. And indeed, the WHO and the Framework Convention um, wants more research on this area. Um, in terms of slim cigarettes, someone asked, is there evidence? Yes, yes, and yes. We have good evidence from young people across the UK, young girls who say, they find these attractive. They find these packs are things that they can pretend to their parents they're not smoking because it looks like lipstick or perfume, and, um, and they've even got flowers on the cigarettes themselves. They're clearly marketed at young, young girls, and they clearly are effectively marketed at young girls. We want to see them out of the way altogether. Um, final point from me, um, somebody mentioned that counterfeit cigarettes are presumed to be more harmful than the real thing. The real, the genuine cigarettes ha, um, have up to 70 cancer-causing agents in them. They kill one in two um, people who use them long-term. Um, anything else that goes into a counterfeit cigarette is probably not going to kill you any quicker than a genuine cigarette is going to do. So I'll pass over to my colleagues. Vielen Dank. Please. Thank you very much. To respond to a number of the comments uh, on the issue of passive smoking warnings. This is an area where there is some awareness, but far from fully informed public. One challenge for regulators is the number of different smoking-related diseases that one could put on a warning. I think there are more than two dozen diseases, but certainly there's consensus uh, among regulators and health authorities that warnings on passive smoking are among the most important. Uh, just to follow up on the comment about slim cigarettes, how do we know that they're important? I'm happy to share with you the industry reference that I have regarding the increase of sales in slim cigarettes. I was asked a question about e-cigarettes in the Canadian market. We have a very peculiar regulatory system where electronic cigarettes with nicotine are prohibited. We have the sale of electronic cigarettes and they're going up in popularity, but there is apparently no nicotine in them. I would not hold Canada up as a model. We have very little understanding of these products, and I would say that our regulatory framework is in the very early stages. I was asked a question about packaging and counterfeiting or contraband. Um, in my experience, the tobacco industry has used the same um, argument to, uh, as a barrier to health warnings and picture warnings many times over. That is to say that picture warnings will increase uh, uh, contraband cigarettes. I have not seen any example of that. We have had those warnings in place for over a decade now, uh, and I welcome uh, that evidence if it does exist. I was asked a question about um, is there a list of all these packaging studies that I've referred to? The answer is absolutely, and I would be happy to provide that to anyone uh, in this room. I think your point raises an important issue, which is the evidence that we're talking about should be public. It should be credible, and it should be reviewed by the scientific com uh, community. And that is exactly the evidence that I will pass on to you. 
I also uh, was asked a question about we have a difference of opinion uh, with respect to what I've said and what the Keckham representative has said about the effectiveness of warnings. Uh, if you're asking me what I think the difference of opinion, what is at the heart of it, everything that I've referred to today is being conducted by independent scientists. It has been subjected to peer review in scientific health journals. All of the information I've been aware of from the industry is by people paid by the tobacco industry, and I'm not aware of a single published study out there. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next speaker is Mr. Josens. I have to address uh, three issues. The first one is in relation to counterfeiting. There was a concern raised about the counterfeiting of tobacco products. Well, in this proposal, you have a visible security feature. I think a visible security feature is easy to counterfeit, so I would advise you, in addition to that, to have an invisible security feature. So if you make it more difficult and add to security features, it may be a, a way to make counterfeiting more difficult. Secondly, in relation to, um, in relation to, in relation to the effectiveness of health warnings, I just want to add something on Belgium. Belgium was the first country who introduced pictorial health warnings in 2007. We have the data of prevalence data based on 10,000 persons done by the Scientific Institute of Public Health, and it showed that in 97, the prevalence in Belgium was 30%, in 2001, 29%, in um, 20, 2004, 28%. Pictorial health warnings were introduced in 2007, and the number, the prevalence, dropped to 25% in 2008. That means 3% less in four years' time, and in, in percentage of smokers, 10% less. So the data on Belgium gives an indication on the effectiveness. At a last comment I would like to make about the GTI involvement in smuggling. Well, there has been a long complaint in 2001, and details and emails and in one of the documents, the head of the GTI compliance teams wrote, I quote, GTI management has not lived up to the zero tolerance policy of smuggling, and in those cases that touch on smuggling into or via the European Union, has specifically and repeatedly violated its obligations on the European Commission Agreement of 2007. End of the quote. Thank you very much. So, last but not least, Dr. Martina Pöschke-Langer. Please, two minutes. Now, we had uh, questions from two German MEPs, so I'll reply to them straight away in German. So, first of all, Mrs. Sommer. Now, she asked uh, about the evidence for passive smoking. Well, I can uh, uh, comfort you there. There is enough data available at the national and international level that very precisely describe the effects of passive smoking. They are uh, properly... Uh, based upon valid data, so uh, I can provide that information for you, and we've produced a report on it ourselves. Second question, on the e-cigarette, that's something you both brought up. We've got a, uh, an article which is recently published in the uh, uh, German medical uh, journal, and they were saying it's a very nebulous product. Well, why do we say nebulous? First of all, because it certainly creates a certain amount of uh, fog around it, and also nebulous because as uh, consumers we don't really know what's in these products. That's the key problem. It's uh, not a mature consumer product yet. There are no quality standards, and uh, there are th dozens of different uh, forms uh, of administration. And there are also refills which uh, seem to be very similar, but most of them uh, contain uh, nicotine and very uh, high concentrations, even irresponsibly high concentrations of nicotine. Now, the question is, if you get your uh, bottles of nicotine mixed up, uh, what, what if you accidentally put it in your fridge and get it mixed up with your food. I mean, you can kill people with nicotine. 
So uh, I'm not totally sure about the uh, forms of administration that are being offered by the e-cigarette manufacturers. I find that they're very dangerous. They're uh, as dangerous as the product itself. And now if we're talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, physical consequences, then you can have uh, irritations of the respiratory system, but... Uh, uh, signs of poisoning from co uh, nicotine. Well, yes, if you uh, draw in too much of the nicotine from the e-cigarettes, the consumer has absolutely no control of how much they're taking in. Eventually, there's an overload on the body, and then you can basically end up collapsing, and that's uh, uh, nicotine poisoning. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad you brought your comments to an end because our uh, interpreting time is coming to an end. But I'll give the floor to our rapporteur, Linda McAvan, first. And uh, you'll have the closing word. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm not going to say very much because we've had a very full afternoon of, um, of interventions. I want to thank all the speakers for coming today. I've taken very careful notes of what you've said. And um, there's still many questions that we can ask arising from what you said and evidence and counter evidence which the MEPs will be weighing up in the next few weeks. I'll remind colleagues what I said about the Framework Convention. Um, I, as a rapporteur, will meet industry representatives, but only in meetings, and if they're here, they should note that. We will make the dates available to you, let you know when those dates are. They will take place in Parliament, and notes of those meetings will be taken. So, yes, we will listen to your concerns, but in accordance with the, um, with the um, Convention. Um, and also, I've listened very carefully to all the things that colleagues have said, and um, I think colleagues have taken a responsible view They've raised the questions that have been raised with them, and I'm sure that all the colleagues in this House, I hope very much, will want to bring a law forward which improves public health and indeed stops the young people becoming smokers. So um, I look forward to working with all of you, and, um, and I'm sure we're going to have a very productive time. And we have, we have enough time to have a full, proper parliamentary procedure to get this law in place during this Parliament. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers today, all of the experts who've made their way here and have uh, given us the opportunity of asking them uh, questions and receiving their answers. It's been very helpful. It's been a useful exercise for us. And our task now is to try and uh, uh, pilot this legislation through Parliament. But there's also been a a call, a, state, a call on the council here. We've had a, uh, a clear statement from the council that they want to conclude this legislation before the uh, European Council. It's a milestone in the health policy of the European Union. This milestone is absolutely essential. We need strict rules. We need to ensure that as few people as possible start or restart smoking. That's our job. We have a rapporteur who is a good listener and is in a good position to uh, bring our work forward. I'd like to thank everyone who's attended today, and I'd like to wish you all a good return home and a pleasant evening. Tomorrow we'll be starting at 9.30. So that's when the uh, vote will take place. Thank you.